There we go. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, yeah. It's almost at the four hour mark. Jesus Christ. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you, Yuko. Oh yeah, this still here. <laughs> four months in a row. Thank you. Um. So yeah, again, if you... If you need, like, a bathroom break, grab a drink, grab a snack, something. Something. Because, like I said, this is going to be a four-hour ride we're going to be going on. Uh, <laughs> this, yeah, it needs to be done in, like, parts, but I can't. I can't do that. I'm a binger. I can't wait. I'm impatient. And I know it would probably be better on my sanity if I did. But I can't wait. I can't do it in parts. I can't. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. All right, let's let's just get it started because uh, All right, here's here's our favorite here's our favorite bomber dude at it again. What is plagiarism? Where did plagiarism come from? Who made plagiarism? Where am I? Plagiarism? Can you help me? Oh. Let's let's just get ready for all this fucking tea. God, I, it's just a, uh, in the six hour why we do this game video will you guys quit breaking that up oh my god like the videos are just going to keep getting longer and longer by this point $337,000 tell us the story briefly I'm going to literally be watching I'm going to be literally reacting to shit it's going to be like 20 hours long it's like it's never going to end Oh, Jesus. In 1970, in Analog Magazine, Harlan Ellison and Ben Bova published the short story, Brillo. Ellison's one of the most famous writers in history, but Bova's no slouch. He soon became editor of Analog, where he was beloved and won the Hugo Award for Best Professional Editor six times. This isn't one of his. He accepted this one on behalf of George R.R. R. Martin, whose career he started. George couldn't make it. He was running a chess tournament at the time. Writers used to have fun. Now we just <laughs> complain about Twitter. On Twitter. Brillo was about the world's <laughs> first robot police officer. His name's Brillo because Brillo pads are metal fuzz. That's oh, thank you, Yuko. This is one of the <laughs> earliest stories in fiction about a robot cop, a commonplace trope today and soon in real life. It wasn't the first example. The most famous earlier one would be Isaac Asimov's Caves of Steel. Remember this, it will come up later. Ellison and Bova thought the idea had legs and decided to adapt it into a TV show. They pitched the idea to a few companies, including NBC, where an executive named Terry Keegan said no. They later showed Brillo to Paramount, where the head of development, Terry Keegan, he'd recently been hired there, said no. The same man what? passed on the same pitch twice at two companies. Clearly not a fan of the robot cop idea. Six months later, Terry Keegan sold a show called Future Cop to ABC. It's a show about a robot cop. He's an android, a robot, the perfect Wait a cop. minute. Our boys uh realize they've been ripped off. When I saw it, I wanted to file immediately. My attorney said, forget it, man. He said, 90% of all plagiarism suits the plaintiff loses. Besides, these guys will kill you. You'll never work in this town again. You're they already years being Phoenix. We just started. They a giant television <laughs> conglomerate, despite the cost and the possibility of being blacklisted from working in television. In his deposition, Keegan claims he never read Brillo, an obvious lie. It was later discovered the memos proving he deliberately ripped them memos. off had been burned. The jury found in favor of Ellison and Bova and awarded them $337,000 in damages, about $1.2 dollars today. Ellison used some of the money to put up a billboard across the street from the studio reading, Writers, don't let them steal from you. Keep their hands out of your pockets. Or at least he said he was going to in interviews at the time, and later journalism claims it happened, but I can't find any pictures, which is a shame. Either way, they still made off yeah, with all that delicious kind of a money. Shame. Yum There's yum. no actual proof he put that on a billboard. Moment, that would have been epic. Four years to tell other writers they can fight him and beat him. <laughs> so, I'm not ready, y'all. I'm not ready. What's all that about? Okay, you know that trick video essayists use where they open on a semi-related example Hi. that sets the stage for the wider Welcome. topic? It's a classic. I do it all the time. I wanted to open on a recent example of a writer winning a plagiarism lawsuit and getting their day in court. But there isn't one. 
This ancient case, which took place over a decade before I, and statistically you, were even born, is still the best, most recent, and almost only example. Ellison and Bova are among the few writers to ever see financial compensation for their work being stolen. That's... okay, that's... simultaneously... unsurprising... and sad. It's just... If you really think about it, like, come on, because you know, you know they're going to throw money at these problems and also a lot of people are discouraged from fighting it. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try oh, not to pause too much because this video is like, let's testing, see. Testing one, two, yep, three. that's right. It's for the foreseeable uh, future. If at someone least else on here steals 80 your hours work long. for money, there's not much you can do <laughs> except talk about it. A few years ago, I made a video with some examples of plagiarism and even covered a time I felt it happened to me. The guy in question, Lukey Poo, briefly posted a 10 minute response accusing me of overreacting before appearing to think better of the whole thing and deleting this along with the video copying me. I watched your video, went through it piece by piece and copied it because you're such an incredible YouTuber. Thanks, Luke. Apology accepted. He has since rebranded <laughs> his channel, recognizing the irony in presenting himself as a literal piece of shit, but his videos are still awash with plagiarism accusations, ripping off other YouTubers for hours at a time now, the only new sections being stuff about how homophobia is fine. Maybe the rebrand was a little too soon, but no authority <laughs> took Luke's video Holy down. Shit. He could have left it up, and people often do. You can spend ages on a unique video with an original idea, and a way more popular guy can rip it off, along with its thumbnail, get a bajillion views, and rake in the cash. On YouTube, if you have an original idea, if it's good, it won't be yours for long. The fact I'm making no, this video it's like during gone one of the in biggest creative strikes in history isn't lost on me. Other people's hands have never before been this deep in the pockets of creators. We need Harlan Ellison's billboard now more than ever. But I don't know how to rent a billboard and it sounds expensive. So instead, we're going to talk yeah. about plagiarism on YouTube. What exactly it is, why it's wrong, and the many unintended side effects. Only then can we begin to talk about what to do about it. Or at least, what I'm going to do to try to put some of it right. I'm going to use a few Welcome relatively well-known examples you might have heard of already, and some new ones I found just for this video. I could even ruin some of your favorite YouTubers for you. Apologies in advance. Okay, see, the spoiler I saw was like some of the comments about, about people like, um... <laughs> basically having some of the people they follow or some of their favorites just being completely flabbergasted about who he was talking about. So I'm interested, like, tell me, tell me if you guys, uh, recognize or have followed or have heard of anybody in this video. I gotta know if it's, if it's just me, I'm going to be really sad. So let's start some fights. So I'm just straight up take the entire video and don't have my voice though. Like. Part I, Philip. At least put some effort in, What's going in plagiarism on, if you're going to do it. On the video. Philip Mewson was a YouTuber who reviewed Nintendo Switch games and accessories and talked about Nintendo related news. His videos were surprisingly well really edited, that, and by that I mean they used way too many fancy that. transitions. Okay, okay. I mean, they're not even hard to do. You just drag and drop them on your timeline and what? But when he applied for a job at IGN, his obvious mastery of a plugin everyone else also has and existing channel with a decent size led to him getting picked as their new Nintendo editor. On August 6th, 2018, his review of Dead Cells went up onto the official IGN YouTube channel. But then on August 7th, YouTuber Boomstick Gaming posted a video titled IGN copied my Dead Cells review. What do I do? He had noticed some similarities oh, between Philip's I think reviews I heard about and his own one, yeah. published in late July. Dead Cells takes a progression of a Metroidvania and integrates it into this procedurally generated action roguelite. It takes the progression system of a Metroidvania and transforms it into a procedurally generated action roguelite. This combat system is fast, fluid, responsive, and one of the most rewarding representations of 2D combat of the entire genre. Fights are fast, fluid, responsive, and hands down one of the most gratifying representations of video game combat I've ever experienced. Dead Cells figures out an intriguing way to have your roguelite and Metroidvania experience experience all in one by focusing okay. on your failures you know what this and reminds me to of? try something new the next you know what this reminds me of is when uh they would have us write assignments in school like and we'd have to we'd have to go through what these things there, there's these things called books all right um and we'd go to the library and they'd want us to write like an essay 
on something, but we would have to read up about it in a book. And I lie you not, majority of us literally just wrote what was in the book. We just replaced some of the fancy words with our dumbass words. That was it. That's basically what we... We start young, y'all. We start young. And if you don't grow out of it, you get put in... A bummer dude video. This is what happens. Time. Dead Cell strikes a perfect and engaging balance between the Metroidvania and roguelite experiences by focusing on your failures and urging you to experiment each time you do fail. Dead Cells only falters slightly with some repetition other setting in, especially not even on read the books, early yeah. areas and during longer <laughs> play sessions. Dead Cells does falter slightly with some repetition, but it's only felt in its There's earlier the ones that pretended to do it. extended play sessions. There's the ones Speaking that didn't bother. Repetition, oh my god. The review was taken down and then there's while a, IGN there was like, the there was issue. Always that one later that day overachiever that actually did it. Company. But was this the first time Philip had done this? Catching someone doing plagiarism is difficult. Someone has to notice the theft, which means having also seen the copied work. And if it's anything obscure, that's quite unlikely. If you catch someone plagiarizing once, chances are they rolled those dice a few oh, times Oh yeah, now, before now and AI does it for you. It makes yet. it even more People lazy. People started looking through his other reviews <laughs> in case there was more. Over You're at doing Kotaku, even Jason less Schreier's work to copy someone else now. Was updated to mention an anonymous tip, pointing out similarities between Philip's review of FIFA 18 on the Switch and the one on Nintendo Life by Chris Scullion. Philip's review was made for his personal channel before he was even hired at IGN, meaning he'd been doing this for a while. Scullion himself would later post a video comparing his review with Philip's, showing off the many similarities, and I'll link that in the description. But I want to zoom in on my favourite example. Philip tries to hide what he's doing by changing words around, and he does it really badly. In his article, Chris says, compared to the non-Switch versions, the graphics are a good deal less detailed. Here's Philip's version. However, when you get up close and get a good look at some of the character models, it's pretty clear that they do have a good amount of less detail than the Xbox One and PS4 versions of the game do. It's pretty clear that they do have a good amount of less detail. No one would ever write that sentence on purpose. You would <laughs> only create that by trying to change something you stole. There's a great I mean, example here of the deeper problems that plagiarism maybe a dumb can cause. AR. Philip's review know. contains false information. For English? example, here when he talks about the game's What's women's that? league Can feature. you eat it? FIFA 18 comes with the standard tournament and kickoff modes, as well as the women's league, which was officially introduced in FIFA 16. There there are no women's leagues in FIFA 18. There's women's football, but leagues are specific uh, real-life organizations what? that do not Hold exist on. in the Wait. game. <laughs> him to reword a sentence so badly that he invented a feature that doesn't exist. While these discoveries were being made, Philip made the decision to record and post an infamous, quickly deleted video onto his channel entitled My Response, not an apology, a response. Yeah. Philip denied yeah. everything, took no responsibility, and told numerous lies in this video. At the time, this was criticized heavily by everyone for obvious reasons. But looking back on it while trying to understand this kind of behavior, it's actually really useful. This is worth looking at in a discussion of plagiarism because by being so poorly thought out, it's actually a valuable insight into how people react when they're caught and the different ways they try to cover their ass. When someone more competent than Philip uses these techniques in a them, subtle way, hard. we can <laughs> recognize them for what they are. Thanks, Philip. There were a lot of circumstances like, surrounding eh, it, but at but the end of the day, I was eh. the editorial lead on it, so if anything, that makes it my responsibility. He claims there was a complicated process to making the review with lots of circumstances. The point is to make you wonder what really happened, so you forget what happened. Another way of doing this is to be passive about the events, so it's almost like they happened to him instead of being something he did. Like I said, I take full responsibility for what happened with the Dead Cells review. Philip doesn't say, I take responsibility for what I did with my review. He passively takes responsibility for what happened with the review. When someone tries to use language to imply what they did happened by magic, they make it pretty clear they're trying to deceive you. I try to look at all resources that I have available to me 
before I start formulating my own critical opinions so that I can offer the most Terrible cohesive puppy. possible review. All sides of that the bottom line Listen, is... Listen, I saw one kick a puppy, so it's okay. I saw all the work. It's fine. Even if whatever happened, it was an honest mistake of some kind. But the problem is honest mistakes are easy to explain. Dishonest mistakes leave proof behind. Philip didn't unintentionally write a very similar review because he watched another one. He copied their words exactly and changed some of them to try to hide it. Hearing Philip try to pretend this isn't what he did means we're not just dealing with a plagiarist, we're dealing with a liar who has more to hide. Philip's next lie was he had nothing more to hide. I was lucky enough to get noticed on IGN through my YouTube channel, which if in case you're wondering, is in fact all of my own original work. A truly amazing defense there. Even <laughs> if it did happen, which it didn't, it only didn't happen once. But the goal is what? to preserve what's left of your reputation by getting people to stop looking for more. This behavior goes hand in hand with a special anger directed at the people who are looking. So you can keep looking, Kotaku, and, and please let me know if you find anything, which by the way, their their news editor, Jason Schreier, tried to imply that my FIFA 18 review was also inauthentic by claiming that I copied it from Nintendo Life, and that's that's just so not the case. I mean, maybe he was implying that if you have similarly opinionated reviews, then you're just plagiarizing, or maybe he's just trying to get as many clicks off of my name right now as possible, or maybe he just likes Wait. kicking people when they're down. I don't know, I mean... Check it Wait. out for yourselves and, and you be the judge. He's referring to how Jason updated his article to include that anonymous tip. Philip accuses him of deliberately attacking him for attention by reporting what he has done. The section about how absurd it is to suggest he copied Scullion's FIFA review is probably why Scullion made his video in the first place. It begins by showing this clip. Bit of an own goal there. Uh, by the way, Philip, that's a that's a football pun. Philip is using <laughs> reporting on him as a bid to gain sympathy. Yeah, I did something bad. Okay, really, how dare you find out what I did? Yeah, this is basically trying to see what else I did. Oh Not God. me, the guy who did all of it. This tactic takes a more direct form. But one thing that I do know is that it's not very fun being the target of a gigantic lynch mob who wants nothing more the than the gaslighting that's going on the right now. The amount of hate and threats that I've been receiving on social media have been pretty staggering. And I get it. I mean, people are mad and rightfully so. How is he putting up but his shoulder like that in recent But it's one thing to go and harass me, um, berate me with hateful words This and, is just a guess, but... And it's a whole other thing. So I, would, I would call it like a, a unconscious defensive posture. Accounts. That's just... It's just not okay. I mean, not on any level. Obviously, I'm not no an expert on reading people, but family members threatened over their that's my plagiarism. guess. And there is a valid conversation to be had here about how we treat people who we believe to have done something wrong. And it's really unpleasant seeing someone try to weaponize that and use it as a shield against criticism. He just got done shit talking a journalist and trying to make him the bad guy and lying <laughs> about the FIFA review. Scullion has spoken about receiving a lot of abuse from Philip. It's like fans everybody that talks bad about him. Direct He's like, listen, that person like probably this. kicked Another a puppy or something. reason he had to make that video. If you talk about harassment without being cognizant of the harm you are causing to others right yeah, it could now, be a tick you as well, clearly yeah. don't Yummy. give a shit about the problem you just brought up. Philip really didn't help his case by making a Columbo villain bet you can't prove it speech. You can keep looking, Kotaku, was an especially silly thing to say since obviously people did keep looking. Many more examples came to light. His Fire Emblem Warriors video was mostly reworded from one on Nintendo Wire. Decimating mobs upon mobs of enemies with the simplest of combos and tearing through forts and mini bosses with some of the most flashiest and stylistic special attacks. Most flashiest? His Samus Returns <laughs> review was stolen from Engadget and his Bayonetta 2 review from Polygon I love how, and Jason Trier seemed I love how Bomber dudes over here just ripping the shreds in the, the videos, English Philip language right now. Text directly <laughs> from Wikipedia or other related wikis. Super Mario Odyssey's theme is highly focused on surprises and travel and the developers incorporated many of their travel experiences around the world. Uh, For instance, elements of the Sand Kingdom were derived from Kenta Matakuro's experience during a trip to Mexico and the Legend Kingdom's food aesthetics were inspired by Italy and other European oh, countries. You the go. developers recognized that when traveling to Am foreign the countries, most flashiest? something that really has an impact is the different currencies. All of my own original work. On October 10th, the apology video disappeared, along with 901,000 views worth of other videos from Philip's channel. For a small YouTuber, uh. this means a lot of videos getting privated or deleted all at once. This is actually another important tactic that plagiarists use, to try 
and hide as much of the evidence as possible. Philip has successfully hidden the extent of what he actually stole in his YouTube videos. Yeah, he Many basically came out and said, look, try to find this shit, y'all, and then immediately the afterwards deletes the video and then showcasing hides it, the rest. not as actual copies that you can watch. This is obviously no big loss, but... It sucks for me that there's not many archived copies of some of these videos because, like, now I have nothing to cut to as reference footage. It's just, now I just have to stand on my set and talk to you. His article about Octopath <laughs> oh, Traveler no. <laughs> is a fucking doozy. It steals a bunch of shit directly from Jeremy Parrish's review at Polygon. And let me just say, buddy, if you can barely string a sentence together, people are gonna know something's up when you're suddenly using words like extrudes. When this was discovered, Parrish tweeted, Dang, I got extruded right into the middle of a scandal. <laughs> which is probably the funniest thing to come out of all this. But that's not the only thing he stole no. for this one article. It also plagiarized one of his co-workers at IGN. Words from Seth Macy's video review of the game made it in too. Here's some clips from Macy's Damn, video. Damn, no Both one's safe. battle system and aesthetics pay loving tribute to the Super NES era. While this isn't merely a modern retread of past classics, but a phenomenal homage with genuinely fresh ideas in a fantastically charming rapper of old school meets new. Seth was especially shocked by this, it seems like, and it's not hard to imagine why. To take game criticism and writing original material seriously, only to have someone a cubicle over take a hatchet to your stuff and collect a paycheck for it is so deeply <laughs> I insulting. love these responses. Things were bad enough that IGN <laughs> pulled the plug on almost everything Philip ever Need made for the site just to be Octopath? safe, something I've never I've seen, seen an organization Octopath? have to do I've before. He been even and this interested, is insane. But I don't know if I'll did a video explaining it. the Nintendo Switch's HD rumble feature, and his explanation is just stolen from a fucking NeoGAF post. A normal rumble is just a motor which spins, creating a vibration, right? Well, HD rumble uses linear actuators, similar to Apple's Taptic Engine, which is what they use for the new Force Touch stuff in the new iPhones and Apple Watches. See, I believe that these are different in that they are more likely weighted electromagnets. You believe that? Holy shit. He copied some text <laughs> from a forum directly into his script and just read it out. Why would you even do that? No, seriously, that's the question we're trying to explore here. Why do people plagiarize? Philip is a great help in finding answers to these questions, <laughs> because eight months after all of this died down, he released a second apology. Well, arguably his first, since he didn't really apologize in the first one, but still. No, the first hey, one was just gaslighting. I'm not here to make any excuses or to try and justify my actions. I'm only here to apologize to the people that I've wronged. He says sorry directly to several of the people he copied from, but to avoid making himself look too bad, he doesn't mention the forum post, or the time he stole from someone else at IGN, or a bunch of the other places. He also doesn't apologize for denying everything, pretending it was an accident, or accusing specific journalists of being out to get him by reporting on it. I think this points to what this apology is actually about, which is appearing more humble and honest to try and repair his reputation. Admitting to the truly embarrassing stuff, or the dishonest shit he said when he was caught would just make him seem disingenuous. It's hard to come off as honest if the apology includes lying to your face in the past. He wasn't done making excuses either. Two days later he uploaded a third apology. Uh hey everyone. I'm getting deja vu from these videos now. In this video, he tried to explain why <laughs> oh, he did all this. He had so many insecurities apologies. about the quality of his <laughs> writing and gassy. his fear of disappointing people. I it's giving me heartburn. Confident oh. with my video editing skills and my abilities to create visually good appealing content. YouTube apology video, yeah. But I wasn't always confident with my abilities as a writer. And when I got that big break with this awesome gaming company, my insecurities were amplified by like ten million. Yeah, see, he's because not really selling it that much. You know, there needs to be um, a lot of tears, a lot of deep breaths. You know, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, a lot of snot flaring out of the nose, covered in tissues. Um, and I mean, if you want to make it really, really disgusting, shit out a ukulele and start playing it. Because why not? Because the audience was bigger and the expectations Just were higher. Just snot everywhere while you I play really a ukulele. I wanted to do well, but I was also really scared of saying the wrong thing or putting out a bad review.
Now, maybe it's because he's what like before the and still wasn't owning up <laughs> to, to be the extent fair, there's of not what he did, but I simply all do YouTube not apologies end up the sounding reason. the same. Lots of people have anxiety <laughs> about their writing. In fact, I'd say most writers do. Not many of them handle it by stealing, so anxiety and pressure feel like an easy excuse. From seeing almost all of Philip's videos, I feel comfortable in calling myself a Philip scholar at this point, I can tell you for a fact that he is bad at making videos. He thinks cinematic transition packs equal good editing, which is the reddest possible flag, but even <laughs> in terms of basic content, the videos are just bad. His earliest videos are just news about the then upcoming Nintendo Switch, or stuff like the top five ways to play the Switch, a console that no one can play. The single Joy-Con method, and it's probably going to be the least preferred way to play the Nintendo Switch. When the Switch was out, he branched out into reviewing accessories like carrying cases and stuff and doing unboxing videos. Some videos are just summarizing Nintendo press releases. This is the literal definition of content. It's like it got squeezed out of a Nintendo branded tube somewhere. It's the most <laughs> how do you do fellow kids energy I've ever seen coming out of a 28 year old man. So he started doing the most egregious audience growth tricks for dummies you can imagine, like constantly having giveaways for subscribers. Philip's following didn't grow organically from people liking him or his work. Those people don't exist. It grew from offering free shit if you subscribed. But I'm gonna give Philip some credit here and yeah, say some point, he it's kind of different if there's a giveaway on like a channel that's doing. already large. I mean, if it's obvious to me you know? watching them, it must have been obvious to him making them, right? So, what do you do but if you know oh. you won't get ahead without copying someone better? You copy someone better. And I'm not even talking that's about That's like my broke ass here. going on a next video, stolen, like, I'm giving away a brand new PlayStation 5. Done some pretty useful it's like, reviews, and one of them was I have nothing in the bank. How can I afford this? It did surprisingly well, and he gives it a proper workout as someone who clearly knows their stuff with fighting games. A few weeks later, Philip coincidentally decided to review the same thing. But Philip isn't a fighting game aficionado, so his live gameplay footage is him playing Sonic and uh, Mario Kart, making this review functionally useless as a review of a controller made for fighting games, but Nihongo Gamer also in the same video reviewed this Switch holder that looks like a little arcade machine. Philip, coincidentally, is also reviewing one of these in his video. This game is so much better now. This makes this game so much better. This isn't even plagiarism, wow. it's just strange. Philip didn't know how to build an identity of his own, so he just borrowed the style and content of successful videos in an extremely cynical this way. This is reminding me of these oh videos God, for on. the fun of it or because he can This is kind of reminding me of um what the fuck was that movie from a while ago, but about this dude that literally just uh kills other dudes and takes on their their like personas and looks and everything. And he just continues to do it, just continues to befriend random guys, kills them, and then takes on their persona for himself. I can't remember the movie, but I think it was actually based on like a true story or something. And it's it's reminding me of that. I know it's a little darker than uh, you know, still in YouTube ideas and shit, but it's what it, it's what it's reminding me of and it's it's fucking wild Head about making them it was always just about chasing success by any means necessary and when that didn't work out he just five ps ones in a box honestly got into this mess in a fairly recent interview he's described himself during this say period no as having imposter to having syndrome so many people that's wishful thinking <laughs> isn't it there's a difference between having imposter syndrome and being an imposter objectively speaking philip pretended to be a reviewer and critic while actually just being a thief and a liar. But I think it's possible to reverse engineer this falsehood and arrive at its core truth. The explanation lies in a little thing he said in apology number three. I consider it the most meaningful thing Philip has ever said. It's not true, but it's meaningful. <laughs> Phoenix so I took me. from sources who I trusted and respected and, <laughs> and I agreed with, and I tried to change them in a way that I would say it. Philip claims he sought out reviews from other people he respected to steal and learn from. But, to be blunt, who the fuck is Boomstick Gaming? When this happened, Boomstick's channel had just over 10,000 subscribers. Barely anyone had any idea he existed. And look at the other places he copied from. Mostly random websites, niche gaming outlets, fucking forum posts. If you consider something so obscure you can get away with stealing it, you do not respect it. Philip copied these people because he thought what they were doing was beneath respect. Remember Caves of Steel? I told you it would come up again, you little bastard. You better not have forgotten. In 
the lawsuit between Ellis and Bova and the studios, one tactic the studios used was yo to me, accuse me, them me. of being the real plagiarists. Ac accidental plagiarism of steel when they were writing Brillo. The problem the chat. is these writers were all friends who <laughs> knew and respected each other, so they could ask Isaac Asimov what he thought of that. So we went to New York. I've known Isaac for 25 years. And, uh, and Isaac, in his deposition, said, I've known Harlan for 25 years. He said, you don't steal from your friends. It all sounds so simple when Isaac Asimov says it. At the start, I briefly mentioned one of the many times someone's entire idea and thumbnail have been copied. The thief later flipped the thumbnail and changed the color of his shirt. Amazing. This guy's kind of <laughs> notorious for stealing from people. And there was a really notable encounter where he made fun of a guy by joking about how many subscribers he had. This comes off as generic former Vine star narcissism, but it's difficult to ignore that he specifically steals from people he considers beneath him, having a lower number. If you're not as important, your ideas are up for grabs. In 2016, Melania Trump's speech at the Republican uh, National Convention what? was found to have plagiarized one of Michelle Obama's speeches at the Democratic oh National my Convention. God. The audience hadn't seen a speech given at the other convention, so none of them noticed, but the media did later. The question going unasked at the time, at least for me, was, why Michelle Obama? Her speech about hope and dignity and respect and dreams had nothing to do with being a Republican. They hate that <laughs> shit. Why didn't the writer rip off a Nancy Reagan speech about killing the poor or locking oh. up black people for using the drugs her husband gave them? Well, oh, plagiarizing Jesus another Christ. Republican would annoy Republicans, <laughs> whose opinion the writer actually cares about. If you respect someone, or want their respect, you generally don't risk a fight with them by jacking their shit. But if you don't like someone, stealing is almost like getting one over on them, isn't it? No one was ever fired or seemingly punished in any way for stealing a speech and pretending they wrote it. And that's because none of these people give a shit about Michelle Obama. They're probably <laughs> glad it happened. If you broke into Obama's house and stole some of his silverware, most speakers at this convention would pay you a cash prize. Plagiarism is an insult. And don't people love to insult their enemies? Here's something petty I should have forgotten about but didn't. When Lukey Poo made his short-lived video response, while defending himself on the grounds he actually got the idea from someone on Twitch who saw my video, and they're definitely real, he still took the time to explain that he also didn't like I criticized right-wing YouTubers he was a fan of. I thought H Bomber was a relatively decent video creator. I disagreed and didn't like some of the stuff he did, like when he went after Sargon of Akkad and some other YouTubers. This sat with me. Why was it so important for him to signal his allegiances like this? I think the point was to make his theft an act in a larger culture war. Even if he did rip me off, I'm the bad guy. I don't deserve to be treated properly, so if anything, it's good if he did. You don't steal from your friends, you steal from the guy who made fun of daddy. At this point I'm convinced the only thing H-Bomber guy needs more than a testosterone shot and some estrogen blockers is a lesson in humility. Okay, where does, and I mean this as a compliment, the most fuckable twink I've ever seen in my life get off telling me how to manage my two levels? Is he speaking from experience? The way he <laughs> <laughs> the most fuckable tweak. <laughs> also, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> okay, before before I pass away from that, um, I remember I don't I don't remember what video, but I think he's mentioned it before. Um. Bomber dude, um, he's mentioned that, uh, he has, like, actual high levels of testosterone or something like that. That's why he's, he mentioned that was why he was, like, balding or something, and he said, like, he made a joke about it. it, it <laughs> so, it, it's, um, uh, it's a little weird whenever they talk about that kind of thing, because... I'm pretty I can't remember what video he mentioned it in but he said he actually has like a high level of it and he said he you know if everybody's envious of it or something they can have it and his balding head <laughs> I can't, God, I can't remember which video it was. To attacking his accusers feels all too familiar to me as someone who has received the same treatment from it's someone like him. Boy There's this uh, indignation yeah. to it. I'm better it's than probably you. It then, How yeah. dare you tell me not to steal? What's emerging here is a social element to theft. I, I love how we're just to have this belief they are driving better by than their the, targets. The twink. More important, I love how we're just driving deserving by. Of look, credit. Look, better politics. Look at, look at that a twink. better class of person. Your ideas are wasted on you. 
they'd be much better served in my videos. Other games people looked down on what Philip did with so much anger, and people from IGN continued to be aggressive at him for years afterwards, because they understand this instinctively. His actions essentially said out loud, he thinks games writing is so worthless it's okay for him to steal it. The IGN crew were especially entitled to be angry about Philip though, because he did really damage their credibility. When your company produces plagiarized stuff, it damages people's faith in your institution and its ability to not do that, and it's really hard to get that goodwill back. This leads us, as all things do, to the angry video game nerd, part E. Cinemassacre. Uh, the Angry Video Game Nerd is a popular series in which- I don't need to explain this- AVGN made James <laughs> Rolfe a household name the world over, in cool households. Under the umbrella of his mostly one-man production company, Cinemassacre, James made other things too. One of these, and my favourite, was Monster Madness, where every October James yeah, would release a video about this every dude, single but I day never, about an old I never really monster watched movie. Him, so. I used to rewatch these whenever I was hungover in I university. Do know about it always made me feel way better. There's an infectious positivity to hearing someone share something they genuinely enjoy. Good stuff. As the years went on and he got busy with other projects, and having children, I mean his wife had the children, you get it. Monster Madness <laughs> took a back seat. Some years he only made a few new ones. The guy was busy, or maybe he'd lost interest in a project he'd done for over a decade at that point, and that's fair enough. But then Screenwave got involved. For people with better things to do, Screenwave Media is a YouTube network slash influencer agency thing who work with various YouTubers, helping them produce content by editing their they videos like for them, assisting yeah. with writing, and helping them find like, sponsors. Like, I knew about they him, but I never was really interested in watching forms, his but content. But they work especially closely with Cinemassacre. The writing and editing of the really AVGN mesh with videos me. became different and weird, like someone else was doing those parts. The channel started making new types of video, which were like James standing kind of awkwardly in the corner while Screenwave employees discussed a movie. There was a Cinemassacre podcast and James often just wasn't in it. The guy whose Stop channel it was became an optional happened. side character. Oh, and everything became packed with sponsorships. If you really don't good. know, yeah, Skillshare. I don't, it got so bad, yeah, I don't episode know, it, 200 it, it was of AVGN just, is split into three I'm not videos saying it wasn't with good, separate like sponsors purely because they sold this, too many brand deals. But oh, we're gonna have to make the for uh, some reason I just didn't, three episodes because we sold I don't know, too get many sucked into watching them. Uh, they didn't tell James. Under Screenwave, Monster Madness became a different beast. They streamlined production by eliminating the writing. It became James and a rotation of Screenwave employees you don't know, and James didn't seem to know too well either, discussing the film and trying to come up with something interesting on the spot for 15 minutes. Some of these guys were basically ordered to be on the show by their bosses and seem uncomfortable being there, which makes these being shot on a dungeon set fitting. <laughs> and you're constantly reminded why this was made at all. Available now, US only. Release the Kraken! The show certainly wasn't what anyone had been watching it for, and the creators appeared to notice, because in April 2021 it was announced Monster Madness was coming back, for real, with the old style of scripted videos featuring just James and his short and simple voiceover. Like the old days, but you know, with Screenwave's help, so not really. Newt Wallen, a Screenwave employee, was enthusiastically tweeting about how he had written 20 of the 31 videos himself, with others writing the rest. The whole point was it was a guy passionately sharing his actual opinions, but that guy wasn't writing them. But some people were still excited. It was a pandemic year, we were all indoors, not much else was going on. Be sure to check out <laughs> Cinemassacre's Monster Madness around the world. 31 days, 31 countries. October rolled around, and so did the first new video, for the film 28 Days Later. It was weird. Like James was reading something written for him, which he was. But what really stood out was what he was saying. A guy who famously avoids politics and serious real-world events in his videos suddenly started talking about how the film reminded him of the horror of 9-11. And when seeing the film today and being put into that time period, you can't help but think of 9-11 and all those TV images of Ground Zero and Baghdad being devastated by war. It didn't take long for people to start googling the words he was saying. A user named ZB123 posted a thread on Reddit showing a huge portion of the video script was taken directly from a review in Film Comment, a fairly well-known film criticism magazine by Dr. Cecilia Syad, who is currently a senior film lecturer at the University of Kent. Let's compare and contrast, well, shall we? Horror films are Shit. frequently interpreted as allegories of our realities. Okay, that was quick. They're fantastic <laughs> or supernatural elements often spawn from symptoms of social and political tensions in a specific era. 28 Days Later is set in a post-apocalyptic Britain, which has been 
been devastated by an epidemic that within seconds can transform its victims into crazed cannibal killers. Following a car accident, he wakes up from a 28-day coma. Finding the hospital abandoned, he walks out and wanders through the empty London streets. He finds that people have fled the country after the outbreak, but those who remain are either dead or become the infected. The group sleeps in debris of deserted buildings, eats canned food from abandoned supermarkets, and fights off the infected. 28 days later, aligns itself with a typical loss of individuality plot. It's interesting to read 28 days later in terms of the state of affairs of the world. Movie so I think they stole a couple of lines. Help but think of 9-11. Just, just a couple, of though. A couple of words. Just a couple, though. Just a smidgen. You can barely tell. Is born from order. It was as if <laughs> Professor Syed's review had been killed and brought back from the dead in a new, tainted form. That's not how the zombies in 28 Days Later work. Okay, it was like her review was the patient zero of 28 Days Later reviews, <laughs> and it infected the... This is pretty straightforwardly plagiarism. The angry video game Couple of everything. had just yep. stolen yep. a film professor's review of a movie. In true AVGN fashion, shit hit the fucking ceiling. What was going on? Initially, Justin Silverman, the lead screenwave guy, claimed this was a result of a new person who was helping, accidentally mixing some notes into a script, and this would be fixed soon and all the other episodes were fine. The new person thing isn't true. The guy who did it had worked with Justin for like a decade, but I can understand trying to protect someone's identity if you believed they had just made a small mistake. Justin updated the page the video was posted on to say it was being corrected to remove some accidental plagiarism, whatever that means. So whoever did it, they successfully convinced Justin, this was I love how they're wording but that. Like, wasn't. oops, There's I tripped on some plagiarism. Of the awful writing you get when someone who can't write tries to rewrite something they copied. The movie starts with the usual tropes. Mankind's experiments go haywire, resulting in destructive results. There's another way you can prove it wasn't accidental. You know, the other excuse we've heard before, how it just happened once and the rest of the videos were fine? They weren't fine. Reddit user <laughs> Retired Fool went on the website the videos were being hosted on and found the second episode uploaded early. Most of it was from a review on ScreenAgeWasteland.com. The movie opens with a shadowy figure with multiple hand attachments who calls in the boys, four men from a government agency trying to deal with an alien invasion in a small New Zealand town. Peter Jackson plays dual roles of Derek and Robert who interact through the use of creative camera work and editing. So Jackson handled acting, writing, directing, cinematography, editing, and special effects for the film. Derek is perhaps the best character in the film. He's bloodthirsty, clumsy, funny, and a little too full of himself. He spends a good portion of the film on his own, I'm but Jackson for it. manages it. He's got a good sense of physical comedy that comes in handy when Derek is dealing with a flap of his own skull that keeps allowing pieces of his brain to fall out. Bad Taste is a gloriously gory entry in the splat stick genre and a true cult classic. Watching it today, you can kind of see inklings of the kind of films Peter Jackson would prove capable of later on through the pacing, camera work, and sheer inventive energy. So Day 2's video was also plagiarized. The return of Monster Madness isn't going so well. We know James didn't write man, this, Man, y'all, so that copy-paste is working was it hard. perhaps the man who was just bragging about writing most of them himself? Uh, yes, it was. The rest of the Screenwave guys looked at the scripts, and many more examples were discovered. Justin confirmed several more were plagiarized, and Kieran, a video editor who later quit, claimed in a live stream that all of them were. We went through all the scripts, plagiarized them all they had tell us multiple, the tea man tell us the like, tea every single thing was plagiarized they fucking plagiarized every single thing this is a tremendous amount of blatant tell theft you. if true but Copy soon paste it became clear almost working. everything newt did and said was copied while i was looking Copy for other stuff newt was made, i saw overtime. he was one of the speakers at the roast of the angry video game nerd in 2013 and he was proud enough of this he uploaded his bit separately to a channel he was involved with and just watching it without doing any serious checking several of the jokes from this jumped out at me immediately justin i heard justin was nervous before the show he couldn't figure out what he was going to wear, either honey glazed or pineapple slices. This joke is taken from a Gilbert Gottfried roast. She couldn't decide between the honey glaze or pineapple slices. Brent Vanderbrook is so deep in the closet, he's having adventures in Narnia. This is a well-known joke from a 2007 Jimmy Carr stand-up special. Come on, you're so far in the closet, you're having adventures in Narnia. <laughs> 
people have been ripping this off for years. Here it is posted in 2009, with many of the comments remarking that it's old and stolen even then, and this was almost half a decade before Newt stole it. Here's an in-character <laughs> Tyrion Lannister Twitter account reusing it a few months before the roast in 2013. I haven't seen the show or read the books, so I'm just gonna assume Shame. they read Narnia there too. Don't correct me. While I was researching <laughs> this topic, I found a Reddit post collecting all the places he stole from for this roast. Obviously, there were a bunch. When I found this, I was worried people would think I just got this from here. I assure you I do my own research and don't just read Reddit posts. As proof, they haven't found the source for the Narnia one. So, don't I feel special? Unless Jimmy Carr got it from somewhere else too. Uh, He's already stealing from the Dude's British so taxpayer, special. so I wouldn't be surprised. Newt had just been very sloppily taking shit for over a decade. The guy was fired, and from the sounds of things, every Everyone's bitter about it, especially the guys who had to make new Monster Madness videos to an That's insanely That's actually a good point, but deadline. also, I've, ac we have to I've actually been seeing stuff where the AI is literally actually plagiarizing itself. Like, it'll literally, uh, I've seen some AIs, like, I think it depends on what you're using or whatever, but some of them are literally, they're doing the same thing. But I think they, instead of, like, just copying and pasting from one thing, They'll copy and paste from multiple things. Unless you get a real shitty AI and it just copies and pastes like this. Right. I'm telling you, the copy and paste and is a full-time employee in overworking week. itself. Even James Rolfe himself got involved. He quite famously avoids talking about controversial stuff, like 9-11. But there was enough confusion <laughs> he saw fit to descend from his throne of gold and put up an unlisted video explaining what happened. One of our writers had somehow added a portion that was taken from a pre-existing article. That's unacceptable, and all of us here apologize for letting that sneak in. He went with the story Justin did. Sneak Some in. new guy okay. pasted something wrong and confused his notes into the script. The short story is somebody fucked up. Somebody knew. I'm not sure if this was recorded before this turned out to be a lie, or if they just decided they didn't need to explain it to the public in detail. And that's understandable. But either way, it wasn't somebody new. It was somebody newt. That's your joke for this video. Doing research, <laughs> I found an interview with Newt about a low-budget horror film he wrote. However, the picture they used was Philip Mewson. I have no idea how this happened, but it's very funny. For the creative people watching, there's a kind of positive lesson here. You might be mystified why someone would copy stuff for a review. Why is it so hard to just write your opinions on something? But it turns out writing a good review is really difficult. For example, I use the phrase it turns out more than once every video by accident because I'm bad at it. I'm not even joking. <laughs> I've written it turns out in the next section without realizing it. That's how fucking bad I am. Being able to write a good review is a unique and difficult skill. Creative people often have trouble recognizing their skills as skills because eventually they feel like second nature and they don't feel real and practical like Oh no, I get what you're saying, Phoenix. It's like doming. But if, if people are going to be using AI that literally just plagiarizes for them, they're not going to know because they don't do research. <laughs> it's as simple as that. The irony. The irony. It turns in that this stuff actually is valuable. If it wasn't people wouldn't be stealing it. Creativity doesn't feel super special or unique until you realize people have to plagiarize it. Ugh, I accidentally bought this in size twink instead of bear. <laughs> size like twink? Talcum powder with that, <laughs> sir. No, no, it's fine. Oh, oh. Oh, I could wring I could wring the sweat out from that and probably oh, sell it. It's worth noting that, that even when the plagiarism was cleared up, the new videos are still weird. The entire appeal of Monster Madness was it was one guy passionately sharing his opinions. If someone else wrote those opinions, even if they're not stolen, what exactly is the point? James put this better himself a few years back before this all began. I want to make original films. Lots of people say, well, get somebody to help. Well, I can't get somebody else to write the review for me. It's an opinionated thing. Uh, imagine if it was somebody else's words and they say, this movie's great, and then I think, oh, well, this movie sucks. So if I'm doing the review, 
Obviously, I have to see the movie and write the script. It's all me. This is probably why he made a statement about this. Most people watching would have assumed James wrote the words he was saying, especially since he'd been so vocal about this before. This is an insidious side effect of plagiarism in larger operations. It implicates the person reading the script, not just its writer. But here, the plagiarism is just a symptom of the direction Cinemassacre's videos have taken. The unstolen ones are almost as strange as the <laughs> yeah. stolen ones AI in the ways James copy -paste, was predicted. Really? You can only hand off so much of your work before it stops being yours. It feels weird to say this about videos where a guy right, calls Phoenix, a game from 1992 oh my God, a fuck Phoenix, stick, of course you had but that the part. magic is gone. <laughs> These aren't videos anymore. They're products. Late Stage Cinemassacre is so low effort, the scripts have obvious grammatical errors, and James just reads them without even bothering to change them. And it's with these survivors that Jim will struggle to stay alive with. These videos used to come from a place of interest and care, to entertain or share something. Now they're made by a production line for only one reason. ExpressVPN.com slash Cinemassacre. Internet video as a business is at odds with internet video as a medium, dare I say, an art form, put the gun down. The increased <laughs> industrialization of videos doesn't necessarily make the videos better, just easier to make. But if you want to make as much money as possible in the short term, you cut those corners and you make as much product as possible. This gives me a chance to respond to the most common question about plagiarism on the internet, which is, why should we care? Does it really matter in the grand scheme if a review of Octopath Traveler or 28 Days Later is stolen? If you think that, you should try extruding that logic a bit further until it reaches the pain receptors of your brain. Internet video isn't a silly playground where teens pretend to be scared of horror games anymore. It's a business. There is real money to be made in this space, or so the emails from the World of Tanks guys keep telling me. So it's definitely worth interrogating the fact people's work is being exploited in these money-making endeavors. This issue will become relevant later, and by later, I mean now. If you want to maximize <laughs> your profits by making a video every other day, how do you write that much material? You don't, part Illuminati. Oh, it's I've pun. heard of this one. I, I don't need to impress you. In 2021, when I was working on the vaccines and autism video, I needed something to listen to in the background while I built an Argos bookshelf. So out of <laughs> curiosity, I put on other videos on the topic. One of them was by a channel called Illuminati, whose real name is Blair Zon. I hadn't heard of her before. She seems to do videos covering multi-level marketing schemes, pyramid schemes, and failed businesses, stuff like that. And she seems to make a lot of them really quickly. I wonder how. The video was... Fine? My phone was several meters away and I couldn't be bothered to reach out and get it and change the playlist, so it just kept going through her anti-vax videos. And at one point, I did a double take. There was a joint inventor on these products, a man named Hugh Fudenberg, a former immunologist who has been long yeah, controversial. I've seen, I've seen in stuff about this. In 1989, he was caught up in a bizarre I've never lawsuit with the Food and Drug this Administration, channel. which told him he had to stop injecting his autistic patients with blood products. Like, I've never watched anything from this channel, but let me tell you, that channel was sure popping up all over my recommended when this shit hit. All of a sudden, I was hearing all the tea about this channel I had no idea about. <laughs> I remember pausing, budget B&Q hammer in hand, and thinking, haven't I heard this exact sentence before? In 1989, he was caught up in a bizarre lawsuit involving the Food and Drug Administration, which told him he had to stop injecting his autistic child patients with blood products. An interesting thing about the MMR scandal is literally all of its big discoveries can be attributed to the work of one man, Brian Deere, whose years of diligent journalism yeah, exactly, are basically Phoenix. why we know what That's we the do thing. about Andrew Wakefield. There's going to be at least one person MMR, that notices, they didn't tell you, and it only takes one. Effectively berserk eclipsed Wakefield's career as a legitimate doctor. It's great, and Brian uploaded it to his own YouTube channel for free in 2014, so anyone can go watch it. This version has the time code burned in at the bottom, which which is kind of cute, but if you wanted to make your own video about the subject and use that as source footage, that's kind of annoying to look at. So I spent like two full days of my life trying to find a version without the timecode, and I finally found what I think is a copy of the original broadcast from 2004. Harrowing stories of child abuse do not pair well with teasers for the TV premiere of Moulin Rouge. <laughs> well. Well, 
When Dr. Wakefield launched the MMR yeah. scare back in 1998, I used footage from Beer's documentary it's a bit and my of video, a, explained a bit of a change how important there. it was, thanked Brian for all of his hard work, and even recommended his book on the subject that had just come out. And he actually emailed my producer, Kat, with metrics showing people actually did go out and buy the book after <clears> seeing <throat> my video. Which is great, I love knowing that my audience actually reads books, thank you so much. So, <laughs> the reason the Illuminati video sounded so familiar was because I had just rewatched that documentary. Then in 1995, he was suspended from practicing medicine. Then in 1995, he was suspended from practicing medicine. And made to pay a $10,000 fine for his misuse and misprescribing of controlled drugs. And made to pay a $10,000 fine for his misuse of prescribing controlled drugs. Professor Fudenberg has long been controversial. Hugh Fudenberg, a former immunologist who has been long controversial. Been long controversial? So... <laughs> this is weird. She wasn't <laughs> quoting Dear. She was saying his words out loud as if she wrote them. So what's happening here? Well, after the bookcase seemed to stand up on its own, despite all the pieces mysteriously left over, I watched the video properly <laughs> and noticed she does acknowledge Brian Deere and the documentary pretty openly. In 2004, Brian Deere came out with a documentary entitled MMR, What They Didn't Tell You. Blair watched a documentary and then downloaded it and used it to make her own. In the first 20 minutes, she plays a chunk of the documentary or just quotes it 25 times, more than once a minute, you're hearing something Brian Deere said from his mouth or hers. So this video is lazy. I'm personally insulted that she just used the version of the documentary from Deere's YouTube channel with the time code burned in. That's it, that gets to me a little bit after the effort I put in, but that doesn't make it plagiarism. It's just not very good. And hey, it's not like this is her one source. She quotes a lot of other places too. <coughs> Or does he? Here's some of the times she quotes <laughs> someone else in the video. Wow, look at all this research she must have done. One thing though, what's the source for these quotes? Okay, we need to talk about how to cite a source for a second. If you oh, watch any non-Illuminati video essay, you'll see these pretentious little commies put some text in the corner telling you where <laughs> their quote comes from. This is so you know what they're quoting, so you can check it or go find it and learn more if you want, and to give proper credit to the people whose ideas or knowledge they're borrowing. If you're using someone else's words in a video you intend to make money off, it's very important to give proper credit and attribution. Listing where the quote is from is important, not just so it's easy for people to find and verify it, but it's useful context which helps people interpret what they're seeing. If someone showed you a quote that made a person look bad, you might feel a bit cheated if they didn't mention its source is a blog by someone you've never heard of that doesn't exist anymore. I have a little <coughs> rule for quoting that other creators seem to use as well. If someone saw a clip of your video out of context, would it be possible for them to tell you're quoting someone and where it's from? Blair, for some reason, doesn't cite her sources. Here's a part where she quotes Andrew Wakefield. Wakefield also stated, mumps, measles, and rubella together might be too much for the immune system of some children to to handle. I love there's a tiny Andy there for some reason, but not saying where he said this is pretty bad citation. But this isn't a mistake. Blair is hiding the source on purpose for a reason. You see, this quote is from the same documentary again. No, for Brian fuck's sake. plays a clip of Wakefield saying it at a conference. Measles, mumps, and rubella given together may be too much for the immune system of some children to handle. Why didn't she just play the clip? She had it downloaded. <laughs> well, because she's already played so many clips from this documentary, it looks ridiculous. So she started quoting it and just not telling you she's quoting the one thing she watched. I wonder where all the other quotes come from. And more still, it's a mystery. nurses were leaving saying they don't like what's being done. Nurses were leaving and saying they didn't like what was being done to these children. It needed three people to hold these kids, kids down, down in some cases just to have blood taken. I, I feel, feel very sorry, sorry for the children, children who I, I feel, feel were being abused. abused. This study had in fact begun with a contract from a group of solicitors we were that were trying to sue MMR manufacturers. Chadwick said he had hoped the ordeal when it hit the news would, would die, its, die own death. its own death. It includes injecting mice with measles virus. He injected mice with measles, extracting <sighs> blood cells extracted their white blood cells and, and injected, injected the, the stuff, stuff into, into pregnant, pregnant goats. goats. 
This is amazing. Not the pregnant she just ghost. quotes people from this one documentary and pretends she did any work. Eventually, she stops bothering to even make it look like a quote and just starts saying Brian Deer's words out loud. And that's how the stuff at the beginning happened. She got so lazy, she stopped bothering to pretend she wasn't copying the documentary. In 1989, he was caught up in a bizarre lawsuit with the Food and Drug Administration, which told him he had to stop injecting his autistic patients with blood products. Then in 1995, he was suspended from practicing medicine and made to pay a $10,000 fine for his, his misuse, misuse of prescribing, of prescribing control drugs. drugs. MMR What They Didn't Tell You has been chewed up and spat back into your mouth like you're a little baby bird. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> My favourite part is when some of what she's saying appears in quotes for some reason attributed to lawsuit with FDA. Like, no, Brian Deer said that. He established a scientific <laughs> system that would satisfy Wakefield and Pounder for testing. And Pounder? Wait a second, who's Pounder? This Pounder guy never comes up again in the video. She brings him up here by mistake because she's paraphrasing another section of the documentary. He established a scientifically valid system that would satisfy Dr. Wakefield and his head of department, Professor Roy Pounder. Roy Pounder is an important character in the story. Blair has cut him out completely to save time, but she accidentally kept this one reference. This makes the copying kind of blatant. She's referencing a guy who exists in the documentary and not her video. Obviously, stealing someone else's well, words is plagiarism, but on a more zoomed out level, so copying someone. an entire documentary and trying to hide it. Like, obviously there's something wrong here. Here's a hint. If you're trying to trick people into thinking you're not quoting the thing you're quoting, you're probably doing plagiarism. But here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> Blair knows people might notice this, so she's come up with a defense mechanism. The video has a link in the description to a list of sources, where stuff she quoted or showed in the video gets linked. This is normal, lots of people do this, although usually they cite them when they use them in the actual video, but still. It's an unlabeled collection of links that's difficult to sort through, but if you keep digging, eventually you find a link to Brian Deere's YouTube upload of the documentary. So now, if anyone criticizes the fact she ripped it off, she can say, no, I, I was using a source, I cited it, check, it's in my list. Somewhere. And she uses Somewhere. this flimsy <laughs> excuse to basically you just gotta squint steal to find anything it. she wants. Blair frequently plagiarizes people, never mentions they exist in the video or cites them anywhere, but she puts a link in a list no one will read. So that makes it okay, right? The video we've been talking about so far is the second in a series of three about Andrew Wakefield. Here's part of the first one where she talks about his early career. He became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in 1985 and a year later was awarded a Wellcome Trust Traveling Fellowship to study small intestine transplantation in Toronto, Canada. Let me ask you real quick. Is she quoting a source right now? I mean, no, it's just stock footage. So clearly she wrote this part, right? No. She's just reading an article from The Telegraph. He became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in 1985 and a year later was awarded a Royal Trust Traveling Fellowship to study small yes. intestine transplantation in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Wakefield returned to the UK in the late 1980s where he began to do yes. more research. Oh no, there's more. Joining the Royal Free Hospital in London, he worked on the liver transplant <laughs> program and in 1996 began researching bowel disorders, can't. autism, and the MMR vaccine. The average person watching out. this is being led to believe Blair wrote the words she is saying here. This is called plagiarism. The audience has no way of knowing she's actually reading them the fucking newspaper. But the article <laughs> she plagiarized is in the list oh of God. sources. So we'll- I love the way he said that because it's like, it's actually so true. It's like, you're literally- you're literally watching this video only for someone to steal quotes and shit. And they're, it's, they're reading the newspaper to you. They're reading news articles to you. That's, that's it. That's already it. know what the excuse will be. It wasn't plagiarism. She was just quoting a source without telling you. I'm imagining an alternate universe where Philip and Newt's videos just had a little paste bin link at the bottom, which goes to all the stuff they stole. Like, as if that would make it okay? This is just plagiarism, but with a shitty excuse in her back pocket to create plausible deniability. The intent behind this is pretty clear. Illuminati videos are like 90% quotes by volume. The part where she plagiarizes the Telegraph is in a five-minute sequence mostly consisting of quotes from other places. More research groups with more sophisticated techniques failed to confirm Wakefield's findings. Wakefield in was actually born into a family of doctors in 1957. His mother this was- This data led us to postulate that there may 
be a role for measles infection and Crohn's disease, even if at present this role in the world cannot talk, medical aid, read the news and shit to people just be up front about. Yeah, seriously, huge chunks of the video. It's not like that's not a thing because it's of text from the BBC. Because it's kind of it's kind of like people. Some some people prefer for like audio books and stuff. It's 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 not like it's not a thing. Like it's not it's not like people don't have full channels where they just read stuff. <clears throat> it's like I know uh some people read shit um from like uh in game lore like video game lore, like like actual books and shit in, in games. They'll just read that and make it a video. And that'll be it. Like it's not like it's not a thing. Just if you want to read a fucking newspaper to people, just say you're reading a fucking newspaper to them. Various papers, Slate, The Telegraph, and Brian Deer. Yeah, she actually quotes Brian Deer in this one. Yeah, wow, very true. But this Phoenix, makes the video is boring. She's just reading pages of quotes at you. So to break up the screens of text and make it feel more original, sometimes she doesn't tell you she's reading someone else's words. She's doing plagiarism out of embarrassment to make the videos less boring. When I think a video is being lazy, I do a little test. I check what sources the video used, thankfully Blair provided a list, and I compare it with the sources you would get if you went to the Wikipedia page for the topic. All of the quotes in that five minute sequence I mentioned, including the Telegraph article she plagiarised, are just linked on Wakefield's Wikipedia page. Oh, I know how this video was researched! This is a really common trick with lazy creators. Go on Wikipedia and quote all of their sources, and then it looks like you did a bunch of research and work. And to make it even better, <laughs> oh she God. pretends she had to look for this stuff. Other studies have suggested there may be a link to Crohn's and measles, just not Wakefield. I was able to find a different study from the National Library of Medicine that's more recent. I was able to find? I mean... I guess I'm glad you were. Yeah. So one of the lights I, went off. Hold on a second. I'm not sure everyone <laughs> is fully convinced that like, quoting a documentary sorry, for 30 I'm moving minutes my mic around, while pretending you're that. quoting someone else um, counts as plagiarism. I mean, it's a bit weird, but she cited it as a source. Why is Wikipedia so like in almost I every see video you, he makes? Little pedant. You think it's you're so fucking up. clever, don't you? But the fact she's trying to pass <laughs> off other documentaries' work as her own is obvious when you realize if you didn't know the source material, you would have no idea she was doing this. To test this theory, I decided to watch a video of hers on a subject I knew next to nothing about, the Fire Festival, which I've really not looked into before. It was no isolated island, but an underdeveloped lot just north of a sandals resort. At first glance, the video is surprisingly well researched, with plenty of backstory and explanations. According to Marianne Roll, a local that owns an Exuma Point restaurant, they had every living soul on the island of Exuma who could lift a towel working. Lots of it is just quotes, of course, she's still just <coughs> quoting people mostly, but the fact there's so many quotes makes it feel well-researched and credible. One of these people was Keith Vanderland. The what? The, the, sorry, I did not mean to pause on that face. Um, the wild thing, like it just popped in my head, is like it's so easy, so easy for people to literally just reverse search something. Like, if you're quoting something, literally type in the quote, you're going to get a shit ton of search results, and you're going to find where it's from. It's like, it's not even that hard. It's not that hard to even check on most of these when you make it this easy. A pilot in charge of flying Billy around the Bahamas. According to Keith... The only thing Billy's is, it, really someone's actually going to, gonna, like, actually... And once or twice, Blair you know, brings look. up one of the documentaries about the fire festival. <laughs> Most people don't and mentions something give a crap or even think about Later, it. In a documentary around the event, Billy himself claims that they had rented 250 houses. She makes it very clear what her source for that section is. This all seems very above board. And at the end, Blair says yeah, those two documentaries know, like, were some from... of the sources she used for <laughs> yeah. her video. I used both the Hulu and Netflix documentaries as sources for this episode, as well as various articles. I think it's fair to say an average person would think they were watching an original work with lots of research and sources, which tastefully brings up two documentaries when necessary. And that's what I thought too, and I thought that was fine, it was a pretty well put together video. But then I watched Fire. The Netflix documentary about oh, the fire for festival. Fuck's sake. And what I realized was that they had rented an area north of Sandals Resort. It was no isolated island, but what? an underdeveloped lot just north what? of the Sandals Resort. And then Wait a minute. Photoshopped out 
the bottom portion of the map to make it look like they were on a deserted island. They were photoshopping out the rest of the island to make it appear as if Fire K was a deserted island dedicated to Y'all, we're not even halfway in and I'm already tired. I'm already tired of the bullshittery. I'm just... Oh. Fuck's sake, y'all. Okay, see... How do you think you're gonna get away with it when it's like, it's Netflix. It's on Netflix. How do you... I... To the event. According to Marianne Roll, a local Fuck that owns sake. an Exuma Point restaurant, they had every living soul on the island of Exuma who could lift a towel working. They had every living soul on the island of Exuma who could lift a towel working. According to Keith, Billy's team really wanted to do tents, so what I did, what I did is, is I, took I took my, my wife and we tried to sleep in a tent for one night and uh, it was so terrible. <laughs> her Fire Festival video is mostly her reading words from the Fire Festival documentary on Netflix, set to footage she got from the Fire Festival documentary on Netflix, with supplemental footage taken from the Fire Festival documentary that's on Hulu. But don't worry, her first source in her list is the Netflix documentary, so that makes it okay, right? And then further down in the list is the Hulu one. Although fucking hilariously, she doesn't link it on Hulu, she links it on 123films.cc, the piracy website she watched it on. Now this is journalism! You guys. You. You guys. I. Okay, let's just watch the video. I can't even. Yeehaw! Calvin claims he then went to the Bahamas. I didn't want this, you go. I didn't want this. The luxury festival this. tents were nothing more than leftover emergency relief tents from her. This is legit Matthew. hurting my head. Apparently, this like, part I'm is getting from a headache. Calvin Wells. Uh, from no, all this it's from the same documentary she got everything shit. else from. One of the things that really struck out to me was that they were erecting these dome tents that were pitched as luxury villas that I realized were leftover hurricane tents from Hurricane Matthew. The footage playing while she is saying this is the same footage the documentary is showing as Calvin says it. She's just replaced the documentary's voiceover with herself quoting the documentary. It's ridiculous. Quoting documentaries you pirated for 30 minutes while pretending you're just quoting specific individuals is plagiarism. To give an example of how to do these quotes correctly, here's a New Republic article that quotes one of the things Blair did. As one caterer puts it in Netflix's fire, it's clear and to the point. The article isn't trying to look like it found this quote. Blair could have said, in and the that Netflix the quote documentary, was said to them this directly. person says this, but she'd have to say that 50 fucking times, and it would make it obvious she's just remembering Netflix at you, so she deliberately obscures the actual source of her quotes. This is to convince a casual audience she found these herself by doing actual research and reading articles and interviews with these people, which she didn't. This is passing off the work that went into making the documentary as her own. When she brings up the other documentaries as if she's only just talking about them, this is a lie to make you think she hasn't been doing it the whole time. According to Mark Weinstein, a festival consultant, a metric shit ton, actually slightly more, an imperial shit ton of this video is just footage from the Netflix documentary. Seriously, you can't even fucking take your own screenshot of these articles? What the fuck? This isn't even plagiarism. This is genuinely just copyright infringement. Yeah, like, the she copyright just put holder like a could filter get this on video it. video taken down easily and maybe even take her to court for the ad revenue she got from their footage. You know YouTube's copyright system, where if you use five seconds of the wrong TV show, your video is demonetized? You're probably wondering why that didn't happen here. This is what the content ID system actually exists to stop, after all. Well, this is why the video has all these ugly filters. What Blair is doing is so obviously stealing that YouTube would notice, so she had to put bisexual lighting over all the footage <laughs> she got from the documentary. Lighting. Whoever's making these videos <laughs> is fully aware what they're doing is unacceptable and is purposefully working around the systems designed to stop them doing it. Blair doesn't just reuse other people's footage without credit though, the video has also been edited to hide the credit that was there. The fire documentary itself used videos posted on Instagram and Twitter by people who attended the event, and guess what? It credits them. Their social media's in the corner. Blair's video steals this footage from the documentary too and puts a filter over it, but also blurs out the social media. She uses a 
few clips from a Vice video as well, and the Vice logo gets blurred out so you can't tell where it's from. Since Blair's making a documentary out of other people's documentaries without permission for money, she's trying to hide the evidence of whose footage she's using so they don't notice and serve- I love how we went from copy and paste in articles to literally copy and pasting full-on documentaries with bisexual lighting. <laughs> I can't. For a fucking cease and desist. Incidentally, when the Vice video uses footage from the documentary, it tells you, because this is how this shit is supposed to work. At one point she uses a clip of a news piece about the festival, which used footage from the documentary, and you'll notice they also correctly credit the footage too. Blair's sources are full of examples of how to credit the source, but if she'd done the same thing, the word Netflix would just be in the corner for 30 minutes. The video's opening <laughs> features this fan art, depicting her bro fisting with a person I believe she recently sent a cease and desist to. Put this on r slash aged like milk. This piece of fan art is better attributed than the documentary she stole this video from. The 25 Damn. minutes of clips and quotes from Netflix don't get this treatment. She just says, oh I use these documentaries as research at the end. And I guess she's not lying. She definitely did. I wish there was room in the video to show you just how much she quotes the documentary without telling you while reusing greased up footage from it, but it's most of the video. There's just too much to show. I also wanted to go more into the ways making sloppy poorly researched videos means the videos are full of obvious mistakes, but this video is looking kinda long, so I shouldn't. However, before kinda I realized long. I shouldn't, I'd already made <laughs> all of it. So, uh, check out the new video on my hot new second channel. I have a second channel now. It's not a live stream channel I hastily rebranded. Check it out if you want to see me <laughs> complain about Blair getting the Stanford Prison Experiment wrong, and also Silent Hill lore. Why would you want to watch that? I don't know. This is a horrible pitch. As a creator, my oh question my is, God. why make three bad videos a week? Week when you could make one half decent video every two weeks, or one pretty good video every year. Uh, videos like this video aren't made for the reasons normal people make life. videos, like to inform or, or entertain or for the joy of making something. They're made for the purpose of putting out more content. Yeah, I don't know the full story for Illuminati. The phrase content mill but refers to organizations which produce huge amounts of material very quickly, designed to get attention a lot of people with got no interest messed in up quality. And screwed over. If you've ever seen an article in a search with a compelling title but hopefully, which says nothing for several hundred words and only tells you the thing you wanted over, at the end while showing like you seven the million that had ads, you've had the them. content mill experience, my friend. Some of these are just a link to a video someone else made, but they got to show you ads. There's a ton of channels out there whose objective is to make as much stuff as possible, as fast and as easily as possible. We just watched Cinemassacre become one of these. Well, from making the amount easier, of videos I get recommended about it, I... And for the ones that yeah. were supposed to be good, outsourcing the editing to a guy they underpaid so badly he later quit, and the writing to a guy who turned out to be stealing shit. The quality suffers, yeah, but if you don't care about quality, you save yourself a lot of time and effort. The people who are in this for the money are engaged in a constant race to the bottom to find the easiest possible content to make and still get paid for. It. If you're a nerd, and look at you, you've been recommended a uh, YouTube short where a robot it, explains what happens in a comic. The sad you. story of Rocket Raccoon, the drunk who knew Batman's identity after Homelander lost his mind. These float to the top because Homelander. there's catchy names and there's <laughs> hundreds of them, so they get recommended to everyone even though nobody likes them. My favorite insane content farm stuff is when an AI explains the plot of a movie to you, but the title is A Woman Wakes Up Covered in Bees or something. Welcome back to Movie Recaps. Today I will show you a drama, fantasy film from 2018, titled Be With You. Spoilers ahead. These are so perplexing, they wrap back around to being performance art. He has only three organs left, but the scientists turn him into a super soldier. It's Robocop! An AI voice explains the plot of Robocop to you! Incredible! But if something becomes successful, even if it's something this also, weird, was that like, people are gonna like try and the do the same thing. PG Especially if it's easy show? to crank out, like an not AI even worth, recap not even in a worth film. It. The opening scene features a guy who finds himself confined within a large cube. The opening sequence introduces a prologue. After this, the chaos caused by the Egyptians is depicted. Today, I'm going to explain a film based on the real-life story of the youngest warrior of World War II called Soldier Boy. Today I'm going to explain the a horror zombie film, titled Warm Bodies. And walked over to the man. When the man saw it, he was still cursing at his wife. The dog king has gathered hundreds of stray dogs. He is leading his entire army to attack the city. Hi Jake Recaps here. Today I am going to explain a movie called 
Allerlero. So you can see how content mill shit dovetails very nicely with what ripping people off, if not outright plagiarism. And right in the middle the of this ecosystem was watching are one reaction of those? videos, oh, where people just upload themselves reacting to other people's videos. <laughs> the money almost makes itself. Reaction videos here. are a key piece of the Illuminati puzzle here, because that was Blair's previous content mill. A few years back, reacting to Reddit posts was a popular format, and it was easy to make, so hacks jumped on it. She used to make videos reacting to popular Reddit yeah, posts, if, wait, and she'd try to add to the jokes. Wasn't Warm Bodies that weird it, one where it was basically a romance between a zombie and some, some, uh, some girl that was, like, important or something? I don't know. It was a long-ass time ago when I watched it, if I'm remembering right. I think that's the one. It wasn't it a romance? No, I thought it manager. came out like After around. All, if I can't trust the president of the United States, I don't know. I might be remembering wrong, but didn't it come out and like around uh, Valentine or something? <laughs> Tricky Dick, very cool man, the Watergate scandal man himself. Extremely boringly reading out Reddit posts wasn't good content, but it was content. She saw moderate success doing this for a few years, briefly forming a communal channel where she and several friends reacted to Reddit posts together called <clears throat> Sad Milk, a channel which has since been completely obliterated, and she's currently sending cease and desists to the other members to stop them talking about why. So that's fun. <laughs> this kind of explains a lot. In a way, that's, Blair yeah, that's has not always an immediate just been red reading other people's stuff at you. She spent over half a decade trying to become a popular YouTuber. Yeah, that I remember the right necessary. one, Phoenix, yeah. Before these, she used to do story time videos back when they were I, really I popular, thought it was basically just like... a notorious video where she talked about clogging a toilet by The zombie version of Twilight. Shit. I didn't even see the whole episode. <laughs> I knew the poop wouldn't go. When video essays started being a popular format, she pivoted again and started making what she makes now. None of this has ever been about actually making something she cares about. It's always been about making something popular. When these finally caused her to really take off as a creator, she basically immediately deleted all of her previous cringe attempts to cash in on other trends. Remember when nearly a million views disappearing from Philip's channel was a bit weird? Try 40 million. Sounds like those videos aged like milk. What? Sad milk, that is. <laughs> <laughs> the Illuminati channel is a video essay content mill. She has a team of editors helping so to put out videos views, every other day, and she doesn't need a writer. Wikipedia's got her covered, and if there happens to be a documentary on the topic, she can just quote that 40 fucking times. The video happens overnight because she didn't have to do any work. There's a part in the vaccines video where she talks about all the documentaries she's watched as part of her research process. And I don't think she realizes she's telling on herself here. And I've got to tell you that I've seen a lot of documentaries doing research for these deep dives. The Netflix betting on Zero for Herbalife, <laughs> the, the Dark Side of Chocolate for Nestle, <laughs> documentary series on the Hikikomori, and all the Goop episodes on Netflix, Blackfish for SeaWorld, there's a lot. This is just a confession. Referencing the big documentaries on a topic you're covering is fine. Quoting them or using some footage from them makes a lot of sense, I think. But at a certain point, you're just repackaging other people's work and selling it off as your own. And speaking of selling, why would someone do this? Well, when I sat down to watch the Fire Festival video, I got served two advertisements before I could hit play, and then immediately got hit by a commercial for Blair's plushie. Make sure to snag one before it's gone because these are not coming back once this runs out. Then 11 minutes in, I you got a message from aren't. today's sponsor, Mint Mobile, where I could get Squixteen Dingles off my Bexed burger. And we will begin <laughs> to unravel what happened at the Fire Festival right after this ad break. Make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash MLM. That's mintmobile.com slash MLM. And then within seconds of that sponsorship ending, I got a second sponsorship. She has two right next to each other. Go to blueland.com slash illuminor. Go to blueland.com slash MLM. That's 15% off your first Is order half the video literally just ads? Orders at blueland.com slash MLM. Now, I don't want to speculate how much money Blair made from this sloppy shit Everyone that was made in about a day. Uh, but I, I do mean, know how much a video with I understand it because it's kind of, it, it is kind of cool if you think about it, where it's like you plushies, literally have a plush made out of you or sponsorships. like a... So I'm pretty comfortable in saying she made a fuck a ton of money from stealing from your channel or something it turns out it's the same but it's like yeah it's like everybody why did this everybody has one now happen 
Oh, it's money! This is a really good racket. I'm almost jealous. With a small team of editors, you could knock one of these out every like few days. Plush and she does. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean, think I'm. She doesn't I'm, need a writer. I'm, I'm well, maybe popular this yet, isn't so. plagiarism. Maybe you give them a pass because having a no, no one's link offered. somewhere in the description <laughs> makes it okay to have done this. But I think we can all agree that even if it isn't plagiarism, it is at the very least. Shit. When we're talking about creative works, questions like this aren't really about rigid definitions. It's about whether or not something passes the vibe check, as adults pretending to be children might say. A lot of this is about how something feels. Case in point, when Blair accused someone else of stealing from her. Plot twist, baby! Party time. Fuck the legal sake. eagle debacle. This is Devin Stone, law YouTuber. Try, and trying to throw lawyer, around that reverse Uno legal card. Eagle. He's pictured here interviewing me in my pajamas in the final year I had hair. I used this clip so I could savor it for a second. On April 20th of this year, Blair accused one of Devin's editors of taking her video's style. They were trying to replicate her videos. Her evidence? One of his editors emailed asking how her editors achieved a specific effect in an old video, and then later asked on Discord if he could ask them there. I know, right? And if that's not enough, she posted some comparison shots showing, uh, they both have used torn paper effects when showing quotes, and, uh, they both highlight, uh, text when they show documents. Um... Legal Eagle is no longer the one good lip. It's cut and dry, really. There's just one small question left, and that is, what, what the, the hell, hell are you talking, talking about? about? This is one of the most common things you see in all videos. No one owns the concept say. of highlighting text. Tons of people use torn paper in their visuals when they're quoting books or newspapers. I it's remember when that suddenly became popular and everybody was using like it. The thing Anyone that had any type of to look editing skills was using this shit. These visuals for years, before Illuminati has used them, even. Do I know Who's how to use it? No. Again? But in any case, it's normal for editors to ask do each I other need how to? they do no. things. That's how information <laughs> spreads. You know those transitions that I do occasionally and Philip did literally all the time? I found out how to do yeah, those the, by asking another YouTuber named Bob. Vince I love how this how argument's he... basically like, he stole my highlighter and now he's highlighting words. That's basically what the argument sounds like. It's... <laughs> It's like, no, no, everyone can buy a highlighter. <laughs> everyone can highlight words. <laughs> oh my god, Yuko, no! I'm made suing! His transition so smooth in his videos <laughs> in like 2016, and he told me what plugin he used. Almost everyone finds out about it by asking someone else whose videos arrested. they like how they did that thing. <laughs> this is a communal craft where people learn and share things. That's why there's 12 million tutorials for how to do a chromatic aberration effect without having to pay for one of the professional ones. Editing <laughs> is for the people. More like comradic aberration. No. The accusation wasn't just <laughs> false, it illuminates, haha, how Blair sees the world. You she doesn't really understand a double the offender concept over of here. sharing amongst creatives because she's never actually created anything. Ripping people off is her entire business model, so she assumes that's how the rest of the industry works, just people competing <laughs> to exploit each other's ideas. To this sort of person, the fundamental act yeah, of Illuminati asking is gonna copy and, and paste some cops in your direction. devious tricks to get you to give away your precious secrets about how you highlight text. Basically, this is a completely ridiculous accusation. This particular thing really annoyed me, not just as a video editor, but because I had a personal history with her videos. Here was someone whose career is built on remaking other people's hard work three times a week, getting extremely aggressive that someone asked someone else how they did something. I'd found the Brian Deere stuff years ago and kept it to myself, because I know this might be hard to believe, I don't like randomly starting fights with strangers, but since Blair seems okay with doing that, and it was on my mind anyway since I was already working on this video, I posted a video with some examples of her ripping off deer in a quote tweet. A lot of the reactions to my tweets seem to show that this made people rethink how they oh felt about the work of someone they previously respected. And this, oh my God, for me, we got two on the my loose. hypothesis that whatever you call this, there's something wrong about it. Realizing how heavily you regurgitated over here highlighting work is shit and then you only copy. Even if you like plagiarized it, it. Now in the back of your mind, you're wondering if it's them you and like and not the person I they got it from. Plagiarism stains oh my God, a person's no, work and makes it tough to it. appreciate even the original Phoenix, parts no. because you'll never really know for sure again <laughs> if they're original. And being the one getting ripped off feels pretty bad too. I'm which surrounded I'm sure by criminals. That's why she posted all of these tweets. 
Now imagine how those journalists and documentarians might feel. Imagine spending your life doing painstaking research, actual investigation, going out there and interviewing people and physically finding things, not just googling it and copying what's already there. And then imagine someone reading your words out loud in between sponsorships for dish soap, getting half of yeah, the words Yeah, because think about it, because it's like documentaries like this, they, they cost a pretty penny to do because um, it's it's not only putting all that work into it but also it's having to travel which is a pretty penny it's that pretty penny turns into uh more than a couple of zeros at the end um and it's like a lot of documentaries they're not all the time funded it's usually people that are like um hoping <laughs> at the end that it's good enough someone will pick it up so it's like, I know this is from Netflix and they, well, Net Netflix is kind of shady on actually paying people, but you know, we're not going to get into that. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just, I, I, I don't not know. not even making it clear how heavily she's fun. relying on you to make her video. Brian Deere has had a lot of trouble with plagiarism. During the scare, Deere got sued and went to court to defend his findings. <laughs> Mom will he be proud. lost his home in the fight to get the truth heard. So when people oh, steal no. his work without crediting him properly, it's messed up. Some entire documentaries have come out which don't credit him. Channel 4 did another documentary about Wakefield recently, and they don't acknowledge that it was his work they were using. They pretend Channel 4 itself made those discoveries. They try really hard to cut Deere out of the story, and it doesn't even work. Articles he wrote and his book keep popping up in the background. Deer has been battling to have his work properly recognized for years while other people pretend they discovered it. Deer actually put it best himself when he saw my tweet and replied to it. Sorry to drag you into this, Brian. While copying and pasting text from other people's stuff is a kind of plagiarism, it's not the only kind, and focusing on that as the only way would be a mistake that falls short of understanding the, the problem. Even when Blair isn't yeah, just reading yeah. other people's words, Put she's still gutting other it. people's work and selling it, and I hope I've explored that properly. I wish the story ended there so we could then move someone on else can I had other examples I wanted to get to, I swear. But on the 28th of just April, never Blair released a video entitled Illuminati Exposed, which contains an apology to Legal Eagle, a response to Hubba Boma Guy's plagiarism claims, and I guess a response to the five other things she's currently being accused of. She seems great, and in the section <laughs> intended for me, she responded to my tweet. So in the interest of fairness, let's see what she has to say. Before I get into the accusation itself, I want to address the topic of plagiarism. And that word has been tossed around a ton, and it's not something to be taken lightly. And I just want to take a minute to define this word. She begins by citing the many dictionary definitions of plagiarism, which is very funny. On screen are definitions for the word plagiarism as defined by Merriam-Webster, Dictionary.com, and the University of Oxford. But then... She disregards all of them anyway and invents her own special definition with a loophole in it. I'm showing oh multiple God. sources defining plagiarism, but the overall definition is going to boil down to this. But plagiarism is to take someone else's idea as their own or to not credit the source. The actual definition, you know, the thing that is wrong, passing off other people's work or ideas as your own, has had this new thing crafted onto it to do with crediting of sources. Chat. The other definitions do bring up not crediting people ridiculous. as part of it, but Blair has made it central to her definition. Remember what I said about plausible deniability? This is Blair trying to cash that in. She objectively has passed off the work of Brian Deere, the Fire Festival documentarians, and countless others as her own, up to and including reading out entire paragraphs from articles without even telling you she was quoting anything. But in this new definition, as long as you hide a link in a document no one will read or mention once you used it as a source, it magically becomes not plagiarism anymore. She then gives the defense that she did cite Deere in that paste bin of hers, but her video demonstrating this actually shows why <laughs> this is a cheap trick. When you go to my sourcing page that for magical this particular booty episode, butt. you can also see that the documentary is listed as a source. Illuminati's paste bin full of disorganized links is embarrassing to watch her scroll through. I assume she was trying to show how easy it is to find the documentary in her list, 
but then she couldn't find it. She cited it as a contextless YouTube link, so she has to have text appear on the screen saying which of these sources was the documentary. What really surprises me about the response is how deliberately manipulative it is. She makes a big show of how thorough she's being in her response. Yeah, I love the fact she couldn't even find it. You couldn't even find Let's your own bullshit, ma'am. You couldn't even find table. it. She shows my tweets about the situation, obviously, and she reads them all out, which makes sense. She's used to reading people's words for a long time. But she doesn't show the video oh my she's God, actually Phoenix, responding no. to. <laughs> Harris no. posted this video saying, and I quote, Personally, at Illuminati, I would define plagiarism as something a bit more specific. For example, copying someone else's documentary directly into your script. End quote. <laughs> After slowly and painfully reading out the entire surrounding context, why doesn't she show any of the video? Well, because it would make her look really fucking bad. If she showed the video directly comparing her with Dia, she wouldn't be able to defend herself at all. It's obvious what she did was wrong. Instead, she shows this one screenshot, which just happens to be the part where she's technically quoting something on the screen. And then she gives the defense that, look, you can see I was quoting it. However, in his own video, he shows where I'm audibly quoting a direct line from the documentary, and even visually, you can see it on the screen with the quotation marks. A direct line from the documentary? The video says it's from a lawsuit with the FDA. I have to admit, this is some pretty clever sleight of hand. She's showing specifically the one section where she technically is quoting something. At the time of recording, it was really obvious to me that it was a citation of the documentary. You know she's pretending to quote a lawsuit while actually reading someone else's words, but the audience watching doesn't. Her official response on YouTube has way more views than the Twitter video she's responding to here. More people have seen a manipulatively framed single image from the video than the video itself. I got some replies from people who had clearly just seen her video and not seen mine, trying to defend her on the basis that she did put it in quotes she just didn't cite the source correctly, and you can find it in the description. Some poor Illuminati fans out there think I'm mad at her for quoting some words slightly wrong, because they assume, in good faith, that the YouTuber they like wouldn't tell them an obvious lie. Sadly, Illuminati isn't yeah. a unique story. She's just the most the, the prominent Lulu tip is strong. of the iceberg of content mill video essay garbage. If you want to see these extremely poor practices in action, you need only watch the videos about Illuminati. You know, Drama YouTube. The worst part of YouTube. Koba no. says point of view, showing a picture of a man with a hatchet, who I assume I, I, is each bomber guy, but I'm not too sure, to be honest. Drama YouTube is I its own sub-ecosystem of content I can't drama mills, shit. I can't. out infinite buckets of slop about whatever's happening in that moment. So I, I hate getting recommended that video, shit. Okay? These people are like, so busy I don't want to hear about drama people don't I don't know about on out here. What Blair did. I'm They're tired of hearing about all these shitty people on here. Not enough that they steal ideas. They have to go out of their way to slander others' work for having the most banal similarities. Yeah, that's right. Wait, banal? And in their most evolved form, they're not even doing that. They're watching other drama videos and making their own version. I've seen the compilation I made of Blair copying Dia in like 40 different places at this point, but what's really amazing about it is that it's now crossed the drama mill event horizon. So instead Holy of being shit. credited to me, it's credited to the other drama YouTubers the current drama YouTuber got it from. In this instance, the previous drama YouTuber name isn't even spelled right. That's the level of research we're dealing with here. I don't oh, really shit. care about getting credit for a video <laughs> I made in five seconds. The point I was trying to make was that Dia is the guy who deserves the credit, but there's still an irony to it. I was trying to make a point about the importance of crediting people correctly, and now my Twitter video has human centipeded its way out of the anals of drama YouTubers into the mouths of second order drama YouTubers who don't even know where it's from, but are ready to reheat and serve it. This is the lowest effort shit you can imagine. They can't even spell plagiarist right. Information itself <laughs> deteriorates in the process of producing industrial quantities of content. The mask has fallen and the gears of the mill spin naked before us as they wheel and crawl crunch all meaning to dust and Raid Shadow Legends sponsorships. Go to audible.com slash repent Harlequin to enter a coma <laughs> and escape this madness. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to reply, Blair. I disagree. I don't think your new special definition of plagiarism with a loophole in it is plagiarism. I think plagiarism but her is definition plagiarism is super, super but special and not gaslighty at all. And Good luck with all that other stuff. We should probably move on. Let's talk about some good videos. 
Remember my video about the Roblox oof? That one did pretty well, didn't it? There's a bunch of stuff we I all enjoyed to it. do for a follow-up video, but then I got distracted I'm sure your mom is proud this. of you. But I'll do that eventually. I'm sure all I'm our really moms are proud of us for watching it. A lot of people I deeply respect seem to enjoy it, and it was even Jack's film's third favourite video of 2022, which for me is an incredibly high honour, far higher than all the real awards I didn't win. His second favourite <laughs> video was Man in Cave by someone called Internet Historian, and that thing got like 10 million views, so I'm not surprised. Personally, I'm not a big Internet Historian fan. Years ago, I saw a video of his about DashCon, a failed Tumblr convention, and it was really just a bunch of jokes about SJWs and how bad Tumblr is, and it was really disappointing. You know, he had the opportunity to talk about uh -oh. a really interesting uh -oh. moment in history, and he just used it to post cringe. But that video was eons ago, and I don't like to judge people by super old stuff they made, and a lot of people I really respect seem to like him, so I'm sure he's way better now. Anyway, let's finally watch Man in Cave and see what the hype is all about. Here we go. No, I mean it. Pull up your phone, open up Man in Cave, and let's watch it together. No, just, just type Man in Cave. It, it's the top one. It's got 10 million views. Oh, you can't find it? Uh-oh. It's not there? Uh-oh. As of present recording, Man in Cave mysteriously July disappeared 15th. months ago and has yet to reappear. What happened to Man in Cave? Oh. <laughs> Here we go, Man guys. Man in Cave is about Floyd Collins, a cave explorer who in 1925 got trapped in a cave. Nice one, Floyd. The video is an hour and ten minutes long and pretty detailed, covering the events hour by hour as they happen. What a unique way of telling the story. The video implies a deep level of research and understanding, and that animation's pretty cool too. The video was uploaded on September 29th, 2022, and was extremely successful, garnering like 10 million views in the few months since it went online. Yeah, I thought it was I saw so the video went down and the then they Every Twitch streamer it, put on while but... they went and did something else to keep their audience busy. Ooh, <laughs> that's a good chunk of change right there. But then in March Oof, of this year, the video that, disappeared. Any links to the video took you to a blank page saying it was unavailable because of a copyright claim. Usually with really popular videos though, YouTube resolves this quickly to avoid negative attention. But this was down for a while, and then it stayed down. What's going on here? Let's look into this a bit. This video is no longer available due to a claim by Pro Sportority Limited doing business as Minute Media. That's what DBA means, by the way, aren't I clever? Minute Media is a publisher oh, so of digital clever. content. One of their brands is Mental Floss, a digital news and entertainment site, which also has a YouTube channel. So, did he use some of their copyrighted images or the YouTube channel's footage? Well, it doesn't look like the channel has ever covered Floyd Collins. The Mental Floss website, however, has. In 2018, Lucas Riley wrote a story about the 1925 cave rescue that captivated the nation. Uh-oh. This article is an extremely detailed summary of go. the story of Floyd Collins. Uh-oh. In fact, it makes the <laughs> unique choice of covering the events hour by hour. Oh, he didn't. He did not just- Floyd tried to breathe calmly. His left arm was pinned underneath his torso, his right wedged by the rock ceiling above. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. When he did attempt to shuffle, more gravel and rocks would tumble from above and pile onto his feet. He should try untying his shoes, said one. Ah, uh, no, we should send him down with a contortionist who's got a mallet and a chisel. Hey, how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting that it was a great idea. Till they started arguing about gas torches. But by far the most common suggestion, of course, was amputation. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. Oh. <laughs> he didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. So Miller took a few mental notes, and he left. Somehow, Homer mustered the strength to altogether wrench the cord from the other men's hands. The rope went slack. Homer, Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor. No progress had been made. For the first time in YouTube history, a copyright claim is real. Internet historian <laughs> Stoyer Lucas Riley's article used it as a script for a 70-minute video, gave him no credit, and uploaded it for money. But let's consider an alternative explanation, just to be fair. This was a real historical event. They're both telling the same true story, so of course they're going to be similar. That's a good point, you're very smart. But there's a difference between <laughs> using the same sources or recounting the same history and telling the exact same story in the same way using the same 
same words. And if going hour by hour didn't make it obvious, the fact it copies the rest of the structure makes it blatant. The opening, which covers Floyd entering the cave, even uses the same image used at that point in the article. Soon after, when Floyd first becomes trapped, the article flashes back to Floyd's childhood. The video copies this narrative framing and does the same thing, flashing back after he's trapped, and even Damn. tells the same anecdotes about his past. Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky <laughs> since he was merely Damn six it. years <laughs> old. And as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. <clears throat> he would dive into some hole on one side of town and emerge miles away on someone else's property. This one's interesting because the words are quite a bit different. Instead, it's copying the article visually by having him literally pop his head out like a gopher. You know how in the previous segments I've been showing all the really obvious examples to get the point across? Man in Cave is over an hour long. If I showed the funniest examples, we'd be here all day. Gerald knew more about well... cave rescues than most. In fact, just that summer prior, he had helped untangle Floyd from a different snag. Everybody was shaken by the experience. Burden fainted as he crawled towards the exit. Most of the other men had to be carried away. World of Tanks is not only the best game I have ever played. Okay, that one was a joke. Sorry, I couldn't resist. There are some differences <laughs> I was between about the to two. Say, wait a minute. Internet historian's video wait a minute. has mistakes. He gets the weight of the rock pinning Collins' leg down wrong. He says it's 33 pounds, while the article lists 27. Every credible source I can find has it listed as around 27 pounds, give or take. And the Wikipedia page lists 26. The rock weighs about 26 and a half pounds. How do I know this? We still have it. We've weighed oh, it. Damn. It's 26 and a half pounds. How did what? he make That's... this mistake when all his sources, <laughs> including the one he was plagiarizing, say otherwise? It's almost like when he was loosely rewriting the script to seem more original, he accidentally changed some of the facts of the story. Or maybe it was on purpose. It's slightly harder to say it was plagiarized now. I mean, how could he be ripping anyone off if he got the facts wrong? Man in Cave is also a little confused about the fucking cave? In 1917, <laughs> Collins discovered discovered a beautiful cave full of stalagmites on his family's land, which he named Crystal Cave. They tried to turn it into a tourist attraction, but this didn't pan out. He then tried looking for a new cave on his neighbor's property, and this is the cave he got trapped in while clearing out, which was later named Sand Cave once he became trapped. This is covered in the article, as well as being common knowledge about this story. Internet historian treats them like the same one cave, and calls it Sand Cave. So now the story has insane shit, like Floyd advertising Sand Cave to tourists, which literally never happened because he died in it before it could open for business. That's what the story is about! This isn't nitpicking. Okay, it is. But this is the <laughs> cave in Manin Cave. It would be nice if he got the cave right. This is the place most people might age are going to learn about Floyd Collins, and it's a shame they're learning history that's not true. Here's a funny thing I noticed because I'm one of those weird cave people. Uh, we prefer the term amateur speleologist, but he keeps using this picture to represent the grotto Floyd know, is trying to reach. I don't know, weird cave people sounds On better. On the other side <laughs> is this. Until he found this hollow. This isn't a picture of that hollow. There are no pictures. No one's even seen it apart from Floyd. And because I'm insane, I recognize this picture. It's from the website of Crystal Onyx Cave in Kentucky, which is about 12 miles away from the mammoth cave system the video is talking about. This cave is often confused with other nearby caves because the names are similar and they're so close by. So it's an understandable mistake to use this image instead of one from the right cave system. But I do find it really funny. A picture being used to represent part of mammoth is from a site whose title reads, We're not mammoth. Like, they tried to warn you, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I saw people congratulate this they video for the effort that went it, into like it. It's, I assume they're, they're literally about telling the you, we're not which them. Is pretty decent. Internet historians team did a good job with this, especially considering its length. A compliment I've received myself many times. That's one reason why this is all so disappointing. This could have been good and not been stolen. W we can do both. Riley is a really talented writer and researcher. He was the articles editor for Mental Floss back when it had a physical magazine, with folks who worked on it calling him its beating heart. Riley is a very well-regarded, award-winning writer with a skill for telling gripping stories. And I can tell Internet Historian agrees with me, so it's a shame he gave him no credit for his work, even as it contributed to what must have been a huge amount of income for him, doubtless more than Riley ever made for writing it in the first place. Internet Historian sometimes cites his sources when they come up, he'll have text saying where it's from, and that's a good practice, but this makes his choice to never cite or mention Riley obvious. He's trying to hide it. Sometimes 
the way he tries to look yeah. like he's done research and wrote this video himself is very funny. There's a bit where he's reading the article out loud, as usual, then pauses and acts like he's about to read something else and just keeps reading the fucking article. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. All right, so the following is a recounting of events from one of Carmichael's men. Casey Jones. Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave, but he heard Collins moaning ahead. So he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10 foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Internet historian wants you to think he's telling you a story he made after doing a lot of research. He oh doesn't want to read God. you a good story he found. He wants to pretend he wrote it. But this, the obvious fact it's plagiarism and it's wrong, that's the easy stuff. What's interesting is what happened next. I've been standing on my feet for ages. I'm going to have a sit down. <laughs> <sighs> that's better. This is my living room where I keep all the books I pretend to have read and also my board games. Yes, I'm one of those people. I even have a board game <laughs> about caving. Uh, this is quite hard to find nowadays, so I had to get I actually it from want to get Germany. back in the board game. They love board games there because they're Just not afraid afford, to look uh, one another in the eye. I can't wait like, to... Um, oh my god. Uh, I don't know if anybody else watches it, but... Um, the Angry Joe Show... Like... He has... One of the best... Board game setups. I don't know if you would call it a board game setup. What do you call it a board game setup? But yeah, it's like... It's a fucking fantastic, like, table and shit. It, a whole setup with it, it's... Ugh. If I could have a room dedicated to that kind of shit. Yeah, like, a whole room dedicated to, to play D&D &D and board games and... Oh my god. Yeah, That'd be the dream. This cave game. For my money, that's the best joke I've ever written. Hold on, we're doing a video about plagiarism. Let's, uh... I have heard of Tabletop Simulator properly. on Steam. Ah, aha. But then... This is a whole style of video now, and by style, I mean one person did it first and then a bunch of boring people ripped her off. Stealing from lots of places is inspiration, but stealing from one place is plagiarism, unless you call it the bread tube style, and then it's fine. I don't even know what a bread tube is. I just woke up one day and was told that I was in it and that people hated me for being in it. I don't even know what it is. Anyway, when someone from Mental Floss noticed the plagiarism and filed a copyright claim, internet historian tweeted about the video's disappearance, but in a kind of suspicious way. He obviously knew why it got claimed, but he chose not to say why, so his audience could freely speculate amongst themselves. Yeah, for see, I remember of hearing about, about all this. the ridiculous reasons YouTube. I remember, I remember hearing about this where it was like, I think they tried to frame it to where. Um, that they had to take it down and that they were going to upload it with like more like they tried to make it seem like they were going to add cut content or more info or something makes things that's down. the only thing Some i can remember about that authority is based out of israel and got anti-semitic about it but ironically so it's fine what an interesting audience he's built. All this needless speculation has helped to create a smokescreen. People assume <clears throat> the video was taken down for a bullshit reason and there is no clear explanation, when there is one and he didn't give it to them on purpose. Internet historian has taken videos down before. A lot of them, in fact, like dozens. None of these seem to be because of plagiarism. He says he just doesn't think they're very good anymore. I think he got a bit of uh, what we in the business call trolls remorse. Like, oh, maybe this video was inappropriate and normal people would judge me for it. And he got rid of that video that's just a bunch of Tucker Carlson clips and reading a hentai in an extremely racist Japanese man impression. That's not advertiser friendly. And we want those World of Tanks bucks, don't we? But since oh my his God. fans are, you Jesus know, normal Christ. cool people, they saved all those old videos and there are several channels dedicated purely to re-uploading all his old inconvenient stuff. And some of them tried to re-upload Man in Cave and instantly got hit with a copyright claim as well because the video is in YouTube's system now. Here's a screenshot that was posted of one of these claims. The infringing video blatantly and unlawfully plagiarized verbatim text from our oh, article and the damn. placement 
pacing and presentation of content is almost identical to the article. Speaking from experience, not normally claims back. aren't anywhere near this detailed. The article's owners are not messing around. This is how we found out about the plagiarism. Yeah, they weren't playing Kat around was browsing with this her one. drama Reddit, as she does a lot, and she saw <laughs> a post with this smoking gun in it. It's amazing how easy it is for a story like this to not get spread to a wider audience, even when it's for a video this popular. The furthest the story has got so far is a thread proving it, just sitting in a random subreddit with like 90 upvotes. If Kat hadn't seen this, I wouldn't be talking so about it, and you wouldn't know it happened did, either. So, thanks, Kat. Keeps... You're so cool. Yeah, I get I if you if it's like in this situation if you look back on old videos, publicly, a lot of people do that, case where, where it's like just cringe it, or bad, or you just to take notice and you do something grew about and it. you're like, people oh, that's on Twitter all the time and get responses and see things fixed. I once tweeted randomly about an old test video I deleted, getting copyright claimed somehow. I didn't even at YouTube about it, and they still found it and asked me for more information. They're pretty diligent about responding to people messaging them on social media with problems. Internet historian can't start a public case about this because he is in the wrong. He stole an article for money, and bringing attention to it would just broadcast to his audience he did 70 minutes of plagiarism. Right now, also not many people know about this, although some of his active. viewers have noticed how strange it is he's avoiding talking about it. Why isn't he telling his audience who to get mad at and go after? Why isn't he giving his completely normal fans marching orders? Uh, because he ripped someone off and he doesn't want you to find out. That's why. In May, <laughs> two months after the video disappeared, a new version was uploaded, claiming to be a re-upload of the previous one. But then, two days later, it went private. On the Internet Historian Reddit post about the re-upload, the big guy himself wrote about there being some complications. Again, being vague about what's going on. Okay, see, this I didn't know the re-upload got taken down months. as well. It's not clear why. In July, while I was making this video, it finally came back up, but only unlisted. You can watch it but it doesn't show up in a search or your recommendations. You can't watch this video now unless you know it exists and go looking for it and get the link from somewhere else. This new version has quite a few changes. It opens with this new clip yeah, explaining I didn't watch what happened, the but in the one. vaguest way possible. Sorry for the re-upload fellas, the original got copy struck. Again, we have a comment about it being copy struck, but no explanation why. He's still hiding what happened, in a pretty sneaky way this time. You see, this graphic of the copy strike has been edited. The notice on the video actually looks like this. It shows who made the copyright claim, but obviously he doesn't want people looking up the company behind it, because then people will find out why the video is unavailable. So now he's editing screenshots to try to hide what he did. The re-upload uses mostly the same animation and tells the same yeah, story, but yeah, lots of the voiceover has been like still watch to try to sound less like the majority the of the old Here's stuff, a section right? I showed you earlier. His left it's just arm in a playlist or whatever. His, torso, his right wedged by the rock ceiling above. Now he is the HD remaster. His right arm is wedged against the roof of the cave and his left is stuck in place underneath his torso. He flipped the order he talked about the arms and reworded how he talked about them. He hasn't really solved the overall plagiarism, he just changed the words more than last time. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. He can feel the sharp crystals on the ground poking into his back. Floyd tried to breathe calmly. Floyd took slow, steady breaths. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. Miller thinks for a moment, then says, yeah, all right. He grabs a lantern. In the past, we've seen people reword stuff they stole and hope they don't get caught. But now we're getting a special treat. We get to watch someone go back and try to change it even more. Like, no, we already know you stole this now. You can't take it back and pretend you didn't. But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. So Miller took a few mental notes and he left. But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. There's nothing Miller can do. So he hurriedly turns around. Homer, Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor. Floyd fell back down. Homer, Miller, Burden, and the other three men were flat on their backs. I want to get across how much worse written this version is. Riley's article has a chilling section about Floyd spending an entire day <coughs> trapped screaming for help. He began a tormenting routine. Sleep, wake, scream. Sleep, wake, scream. Sleep, wake, scream. Minutes melted into hours. His voice disappeared. His arms tingled numb. Pain radiated up his ankle. This is vivid storytelling. I can feel myself going insane, even imagining being trapped there for 25 hours. It's a really good passage. Internet historian <coughs> liked it too, so he stole it. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep, wake. Sorry, I'm moving the mic again. Sleep, 
wake, yell. Hours passed. His voice gave in. Arms tingled numb, pain radiating up his ankle. Here he remained in the dark for the next 23 hours. Now, in the remake, he has to tell the same story, but with completely new words. So we get this. So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help, yelling into the pitch black. After a while, his voice would give out, and he would have to sleep to recuperate. He would then wake sometime later, remember where he is, and begin yelling again for help. Here he remained in the dark for the next 23 hours. It's just not as effective. The feeling of being stuck in that cycle for dozens of hours is oh. gone. It's quite difficult to take a story you got from an article and tell it again without using any of the words you liked. Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old. Oh, I guess I can't mention Kentucky now. That makes it obvious. Better re-record. Floyd started his caving career at the tender age of six. Some of the changes give away <laughs> how uncreative he was, just how much he relied on Riley's work, even with the most basic basic shit. He used his words about someone's hands being bruised and purple. Parts were harder to navigate than before, especially now with their bruised and purple hands. So in the new version, this had to be changed. Parts were harder to navigate than before, doubly so with their bruised and rock-shredded hands. Why would you not just write a new description of some hands in the first place? This is so lazy. What is wrong with this guy? And despite all these changes, the factual yeah, errors I wonder... about the cave and the rock are still the same. It's like this <laughs> oh version was made to annoy me. It's especially <laughs> hard to make major changes when we you found it out. It was made, made specifically to annoy It's almost impossible to remove Bummer, Lucas's dude. influence without doing so much work, it's not even worth it. For example, the gopher wonder... section has been completely removed My... since it was yeah, I wonder if, like, um, a part of it was just, because it's like, I know with some sponsorships and stuff, because that video had a sponsorship, I'm, I'm wondering if they literally just tried to re-upload it with the least work possible, because they had, like, um, a contract, I guess you could say, with a sponsorship, because, like, uh, I know that's kind of a thing. Like, they can le legit just yank the money from you if the video's not up for uh, a certain amount of time. ...copying an anecdote from the article. He's replaced it with a new segment, which is just C-tier reference humor. He would go off on his own, disappearing into the caves for many hours at a time. Have you seen that movie, The Descent? It was a lot like that. Holy crap, Lois, this is just like that movie. Some of Riley's <laughs> article was too short and simple to meaningfully change, so those parts have just been taken out. And all they could do was leave for now and reassess. Everybody was shaken by the experience. Burden fainted as he crawled towards the exit. Most of the other men had to be carried away. And all they could do was leave for now and rest. Since it can't use any of the clever words it stole anymore, the whole thing's been dumbed down. Now Floyd was trapped in a supine position. So Floyd is trapped laying down like this. Imagine sitting down to watch your favorite show and the streaming service has replaced it with a different cut where all the characters talk like idiots now. You made me look bad. And that's not good. I feel bad for the people who enjoyed the original. People in the comments and on the Reddit page are asking why he changed it and why all their favorite lines are missing. They don't know why because he didn't tell them. Why is the new version of the video unlisted and not public? Well, it could be because it's a lot worse, but mainly, by being so much worse, it kind of gives away what he did. This video's fans obviously want it back up, but if it goes back up and it's obviously much worse written now, the 10 plus million people who saw it the first time, potentially even more than once, will wonder why it's different and look into why and maybe find out. But if it stays down, people yeah, will wonder why it's down video. and look into why and find out. It's That'll like be he's trying to delay the inevitable wider discovery of what he did by letting the video exist, but as quietly as possible. So no one wonders where the video went, but not too many people see it and notice the differences. It's a precarious situation and I don't envy him but he does deserve it. Right now, he looks like a plagiarist and a liar, and a coward who's willing to ruin his own video and let it gather dust unlisted in the corner to try and hide what he did. To be fair, the new version now actually cites Riley's article. Whenever a section was too difficult to change, but too significant to remove, he keeps it in and cites the article at the bottom. In the original, there were several places where he quoted the same sources Riley quoted, and in this version, just to be safe, he also cites the article <coughs> to make it clear that's where he got it.
The description of this version also acknowledges the talented Mr. Riley and links to his work. This would have been cool if he'd done all this the first time and not tried to hide it, but this is like if Philip re-uploaded a very slightly changed version of the plagiarized videos and just put thanks to Boomstick Gaming in the description. It's too late to hide what he's done, though that hasn't stopped him from trying. Oh, late breaking update. A couple weeks ago, the Man in Cave re-upload became public again. I wondered how he would stop people noticing its weird changes. Then, days later, he uploaded this year new video, so people's attention is onto the next thing now. The only people who really noticed the video coming back are the, uh, hardcore fans. This was a real clever boy move. If I wanted to sneak my weirdly changed re-upload back out without too many people noticing, this is how I'd do it, and all I'd have to do next was hope no one ever makes the video I'm making right now. Oops. Right, my eyes have gone <laughs> fuzzy, so it's time to get back up. Ah, oh, my knees really hurt too. Okay, I threw out an Ikea poang to make room for this beanbag chair, and it's rubbish. I love sacks full of balls, but not this much. Oh Don't my god, no. no. Oh god, Jesus. I don't know, beanbag hey, chairs aren't what they used to be. That's nice, that never happens. I don't know, a proper apology would be nice. And maybe an explanation for why it happened? As far as I can tell, this is I the only video where he's just ripped something beanbag off like chair. this. I hope. You know, why did he do well, it for really this one? Chair, really, I just really want to just know where back. he got 33 pounds. I'm a simple man with simple needs. Yorkshire puddings with a little bit of gravy on top and explanations for discrepancies in numbers. My parents never took me to see a psychologist, so I assume that's normal. In the meantime, I'm very happy to accept the award for Jack's film's second best video of 2022. <laughs> the version from 2022 is gone. Get it off the list, Jack. Bump me up. Now, what's the first place one? And how do I destroy it? Oh, it's the steamed hams one where an animator did like a million different styles. That one's really good. And it even tells you which styles it's doing and when in the description. Yeah, I get this what you guys are saying. It's like its sources better than It's like even if they like um they cleared it up and and they actually talked and they had everything cleared away and well not cleared away, but they they talked to the original dude about the video and if they could still use it and stuff it's like after that it's hard to trust like even if they're doing way better about it even if they're sourcing and citing shit all over the place like they're just they're coming at you from all sides they're smacking you in the face with it it's like it's kind of hard to trust again fully and i get that it's just you're just gonna have to like it's just gonna have to be yourself if you're okay watching them still then that's all that's that's okay that's that's what your comfort level is at if you're not comfortable watching them it sucks it's sad but honestly there's billions of other people you could you could watch and it's not going to destroy your life so it's like if you think they're doing enough good okay keep watching them it's not going to hurt anybody. But also at the same time, if they're not doing anything about it and they're just like the like that one, uh, what was it, Illuminati gaslighting everybody left and right. Then that's another thing. It's like, eh. Oh. Off the stuff I covered in this video. Well, I guess I'll settle for second place this time. So there we have it, a bunch of examples <laughs> of plagiarism, why it happens, why it's wrong, and all the ways it can result in destructive results. With these four examples, I think I'm ready to reach some kind of conclusion. Just don't touch the screen or move the mouse up. Ugh. There's no way you haven't seen the runtime. You've probably guessed what's coming. Where's the part where he turns out to be on a green screen and the video's about someone else? Congratulations, you figured it out. You know all my tricks. The student yeah, becomes kinda, the master. It's kind of it, like I said. It's kind of hard to trust. Master of shit. If you find one, it's it's like you're gonna see it everywhere. It oh was my real god. The whole time. Ah! Last time oh. I wanted to research <laughs> one thing and tripped and learned Holy too fuck. much. This what time the hell? I had the breakdown and worked backwards. We understand why this shit is wrong now and the damage it can do. The piles of money people make from stealing other people's words and ideas and work. But there's one group more important than historians or journalists or anyone else with a real job, and that's gay people. You know what's worse yep. than stealing from established journalists who in the end are Here doing okay? Stealing from small queer writers or creators from marginalized groups who 
weren't even paid for their work in the first place. Stealing from the writings of dead people who passed away doing the activism you pretend to do. Stealing from the very people who fund your videos, the people you claim to be defending. This video is about James Somerton. Who? 